This conference is being recorded. Good evening, everyone. This is Russ Tanner from Global Skywatch, and it is June 24th, 2013, and this is our Monday Night Live broadcast. Every Monday night at 5.30 Pacific Time, 8.30 Eastern Time, we broadcast live and we use this time to coordinate our efforts, to coordinate activism, to have guests to educate us, to have answer and question, question and answer sessions, and we do everything we can to support each other in all of this, all of this vast subject that we call geoengineering. And tonight we're going to do things a little bit differently. We've got two of the most high-profile guests that we've ever had. You all know who they are. We have Clifford Carnicom and Dane Wigington. And what we're going to do tonight is we're going to start out by letting each of our guests have a block of time to say what they want to say, and then we're immediately going to open it up when they're finished with question and answer session. So what I want to do is begin by uh, giving Dane Wigington a chance to give us an update on what's been going on and what he would like to uh, share. And then Clifford will speak. Dane Wigington uh, is the founder of the geoengineeringwatch.org website. He is possibly the most visible person in the forefront exposing geoengineering to the world, constantly doing radio programs. He has a, uh, a history in uh, solar science, which I will let him describe to you in a little more detail because I think he can do a much more eloquent job than I can. And uh, so, Dane, if you're on, I'd, I'd love uh, love having you here. Thanks for uh, for being a guest with us tonight. Thank you, Russ. I mean, we're all grateful that you've done all that you've done to try to get the word out. I'm grateful to every single person listening on the phone who gives a damn enough to try to stay up to speed on this issue and help us get the word out. Certainly, it's a team effort. It's up to all of us. And for those pioneers in uh, <clears throat> this fight, like Clifford, who have been at it so very long, who I hold in extremely high regard. I'm, it's an honor to be in this company. I'll say that. And I, I want to give a, um, a quick update on what I believe we're seeing in recent weeks, days and weeks on the, on the geoengineering front. It's, of course, drought and deluge which are a known consequence of geoengineering. For those that haven't uh, seen what's happening in Alaska in the Arctic Circle, by the way, for my background, for uh, listeners who aren't familiar with that, I mean, I, I have a background in renewable energy. I'm a former Bechtel Power employee. This is what brought me to this issue when I moved to the Pacific Northwest, tried to get clean air and had grid patterns above my home, and certainly uh, easily discovered the issue of geoengineering, and I've been at it ever since. But um, meteorologically speaking, what we're seeing right now are radical weather fluctuations in every direction. And I believe these um, these extreme events are going to magnify in intensity very rapidly now. Again, the drought and deluge scenario. We, we saw temperatures in Alaska over the last week that actually on the ground were reported to be over 100. Official records, I think, were about 98. It was warmer in Alaska than it was in Miami, Florida. and you have extreme variances in temperature. There are areas of the Arctic that are actually still cooler than normal right now and areas that are far in excess of record temperatures. So, and we're seeing the same throughout the continental U.S. as well. And I believe the fluctuations became more extreme when we saw much of the centers around what's happening with the Arctic ice cap. And there is open water now uh, at, at the top of the pole open water in the center of the cap. This has never before been seen this time of year. The geoengineers appear to be in a frantic effort, a very destructive and toxic effort to try to maintain what ice is left. And in the Pacific Northwest, we've been fried. As we see this scenario occur, and we have in previous years, when there's bad news from the Arctic, the, the method which they set up to try to maintain or refreeze some of that ice is Massive high pressure over the Pacific Northwest, which virtually cooks us in Northern California. In the forest of Northern California, about two weeks ago, we had temperatures of 113 degrees, broke the former record by 10 degrees. We've had summer since the 1st of April here, uh, record dry, record drought, and they set this high pressure up, which spins the jet stream around us. They pick up moisture from the Gulf of Mexico and pump it straight into the Arctic, where they ice nucleate it and create um, more surface area on the ice pack. This is what we... We believe we see happening, and indeed in June, as they set this, this 
conveyor up while California fried and uh, you know much of the western U.S. cooked. They managed very anomalously. It's unprecedented. They expanded the surface area of the ice in the Arctic by 40,000 square kilometers, but at the same time, the mass decreased by half in many areas. So this is a Rob Peter to pay Paul scenario uh, at, at total devastation to the planet as a whole. We're seeing artificial cloud cover uh, in the last two days in the, in the uh, western U.S. A, a very anomalous storm came through, and it was predicted to be record rain for this time of year and record cold for this time of year. If the rain hasn't happened, as has been the case for the last seven years, in my location we're about 200 inches of rain short in the last seven years. That's a hell of a lot of rain. And it's just, it's because they're aerosolizing our storms. They come in to create artificial clouds. And indeed, in the last uh, day, we see a mostly rainless cloud from Mexico well into Canada, perhaps six to 700 miles wide. And, and this is their, uh, appears to be their goal, is to make the largest artificial cloud-covered area they can. That moisture then migrates right across the western U.S. without dropping. About the center line of the U.S., uh, they start to reduce some of the aerosolization, they allow some of the convection to happen, and the rain starts to fall. And that's why for anybody who wants to look up the U.S. drought monitor, just plug that into any search engine, you'll see a line about the center of the country extending from Canada to Mexico. On the western side, you have extreme drought. In fact, the drought is much worse than even that drought monitor indicates. On the eastern side of the U.S., you have, uh, in many places, record wet. So, you know, it's, it's migrating rain from one place to another, creating drought and deluge. Again, we're seeing the temperature records uh, and a lot of the other data falsified. Temperatures on the ground in the west, we're seeing typically a underreporting of actual temperatures of 4 to 5 degrees. So uh, we might see if they report 105 in Reading, which is where I live, it might be 110. This is, this is pretty standard across the board in most places that we're checking. So the data, again, is being falsified. It appears that there's a very, again, a very frantic effort to try to keep the Arctic ice pack from completely imploding this year. I, in fact, I think it may implode this year. There's quite a debate in the scientific community about this right now uh, because the surface area has expanded some in June. It's melting again now. But the mass, this is critical, people understand, the mass is is about 20% of what it was 30 years ago. It's It's very thin very fragile, and the entire pack could implode this year. That will radically affect our weather even worse on top of what the geoengineering has already done. And the geoengineering, of course, I believe to be a major causal factor in bringing us to this point to begin with. So uh, I think we can, it's safe to say that we'll see the weather extremes continue to spiral out of control. And on the, uh, one of your listeners, Mark, asked a question early on about uh, the aerosolization of the clouds and the moisture, what that does, what their goal might be, is their connection to HARP. Yes, we believe there is. Uh, Norwegian and German researchers, very, very nice uh, folks that have reached out to me a while back and are, are very valuable for the data they give. But they've had, I believe, 60 tests that contain fluoride in the rain. And one uh, aspect of fluoride that as it's exposed to a certain RF frequency, it can cause the particles to come together, to coagulate so that instead of the droplets uh, having too many condensation nuclei and just migrating, in theory, they could expose these artificial clouds to the right frequency, cause those particles to coagulate, to come together, and then cause the rain to fall wherever they choose. So uh, it's hard to speculate as to why they're letting rain fall in one place, not another, but uh, the fluoride appears to be in the mix now too. We're also seeing less aluminum, much less aluminum. There may be a, a, an an alternate primary ingredient in the mix now. We're going to do more testing to try to figure that out. But aluminum seems to be backing off. Strontium seems to be going up. Um, we're seeing much more real estate overall covered in artificial uh, aerosolized cloud. And again, the, the amount of the planet being covered right now, the official figures on global dimming of 22%, we believe, are, are short of the actual uh, amount of direct sunlight that's no longer reaching the planet. So uh, they appear to be doubling down to try to slow, uh, perhaps delay even one more year, the total implosion of Arctic sea ice, which has huge ramifications, and they appear not to care what cataclysm.
cataclysm they cause in the attempt to try to do this. And of course, the, the sickening of the populations, was, with Clifford could elaborate on that further, but um, whatever the a other aspects there are to this, and I believe there are many that uh, eugenics and so forth for us, but bottom line is though, we think they're going for broke, they're doubling down, we're seeing more spraying everywhere, the, the radical weather will continue to spiral out of control, and of course we're all breathing this stuff, so I, I think we'll all continue to uh, have health issues from that. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I'm having my health issues, and I'm hearing all across the uh, United States and Europe from people who are having health issues as well. Um, well, I appreciate that update, Dane. Um, we're going to open up the phone lines afterward and let you ask Clifford and Dane all the questions that you want. We're going to get as many questions as we can. This is your night to be able to ask the questions that you've been burning to ask for a long time of these uh, of these professionals who are, who are uh, just two of the most knowledgeable people that you'll find on these subjects. Uh, Dane, before we switch over um, to uh, talk to Clifford for a bit, um, is there anything you want to finish up with uh, to uh, before we go I, to Clifford? It's a, it's a pleasure to have Clifford on. I, I'm curious his take on what's happening uh, on the health issues with this. And uh, no, I'm all ears. I want to listen to Clifford. Wonderful. Thank you, Dane, so much. And I want to tell everyone, again, uh, if you want to listen to uh, to uh, Global Skywatch live stream, you can actually go to globalskywatch.com forward slash live, and you can listen to us anytime um, that we're on on Monday nights. You can get all the information and listen to any of the old archive shows, globalskywatch.com forward slash live. I'm also going to very quickly give you the phone number that you can call in because after Clifford is done with his presentation. We're going to open up the phone line so you can get your questions in. So write this down. The phone number to call in, and I'll let you know when the lines are open, is 559-726-1300. And the access code you'll need to dial is 156-230. So one more time, it's 559-726-1300. And the access code is 156-230. And we'll open them up in a little while when Clifford is done with his presentation. Um, I just want to let you know that we have uh, um, Dane. Dane has a radio program on Saturdays. You can see that radio program on ucy.tv every Saturday, 12 noon Pacific, 3 o'clock Eastern Time. If you want a link, we have an archive, uh, geoengineeringwatch.org has an archive of the shows or globalskywatch.com. On the home uh, homepage of globalskywatch.com, you can actually click the link uh, to the Geoengineering Watch radio program, and it will give you all the times, the link to the archive, and also the link to the live show. So remember, Saturdays at 12 noon Pacific and 3 p.m. Eastern time, you can join Dane and um, myself, co-host, and Richard Sachs, co-host together uh, to bring you news information and guests on geoengineering. So please consider joining us. I want you all to welcome Clifford Karnikam, who has been actively involved in bringing attention to the geoengineering phenomenon for years. He was one of the first to, uh, to bring this to the public. In fact, may have produced, and I'll get clarification from this in a second, may have produced the first major documentary on this. Um, he has extensive uh, technical background in the fields of geodetic science, advanced mathematics, computer science, and the physical sciences. He has been at this for a long time and has brought tremendous volumes of, of information, uh, scientific information, very important information uh, to us, to our community, to not only about geoengineering, but also about more gallons. Uh, it's so good to have you here tonight, Clifford. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you very much, Russ and, and Dane as well. I think that is the first thing I'd like to do is, is really thank all of us uh, for being here, uh, Russ and Dane and all of the listeners. Um, this uh, particular meeting sort of evolved out of, I, I think, a mutual desire uh, for both Dane and, I, Dane and I to sort of uh, increase our level of collaboration in the future. I know it's been going on in the background. Uh, I have to apologize for not uh, returning Dane's calls, but this is why I'm here and this is my time. Uh, that I've allowed to be here, and this is what I would like to offer to Dane as well as, well as to all of us, and that is to start thinking about uh, how that network that exists is going to be strengthened and joined together because that's actually been one of the uh, greatest problems. That, as you look back historically, I saw it very early in the game. There were orchestrated efforts, uh, very much so, very directed and, and managed efforts uh, to keep uh, parties and groups uh, fragmented. And uh, this has been, been in the background for quite a while, but I wanted to thank Dane for um, sort of responding 
both of us mutually to to invitations that we've made to talk to each other to to each other, and hopefully this will continue in the future. And Dan, I would like to offer that to us just to think about ways uh, that we can start to increase the collaboration, uh, especially uh, presentation of data. Uh, we know that there is always limits in terms of staff and what we can do with the nonprofit that I've started is, is starting to show some signs of, of some uh, pretty good organization um, actions taking place and I'd like to tie into your information and, and get them linked up. Uh, what you're speaking of most recently in respect to the, the fluoride issue is especially interesting as I'll at least try to make mention to um, tonight. I thought tonight in a, sort of a very brief form because uh, I tend to be long minded in terms of the way I think uh, about the complexity of what's going on. To try and keep it uh, short out of respect uh, to the audience, I think what I'd like to do is let you know that there's three topics on my mind um, right now. Um, and I thought I would at least introduce these topics in a summary form. And then um, we can either uh, talk more about them if you'd like me to, or we simply go to the questions and uh, it being uh, good enough to let you know that uh, these are the topics I'd like to make aware, make us aware of, and then we can go from there. Um, the first question I have, uh, Russ, is, do you think that that screen share is going to work and be available to people tonight? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I can put that live right now if you like. Okay. That, that would be great. Um, you know, as Dane, as Dane was talking and I was thinking about this, uh, this became my third topic, which I'll bring up to the front. And... You know, I always sort of revisit uh, things and, and ask, what are the basics here? And one of the basics that popped to mind here is sort of the basis of your of your organization and the activism that takes place, and to really hit that at the heart of it. And I remember in the earliest papers that I wrote back in 1999, starting there, there was a phrase that started popping up right at the beginning in my work. And over the years, this phrase still exists. It's existed for over 200 plus years, and it's never gone away. And I see this as the absolute heart, basically, of recognizing both our responsibility uh, as well as our power that we have if we simply realize it and accept it, and then you know basically employ that power. So I have something up on the screen that might seem, uh, oh, I hope it doesn't seem trivial or trite to people, but these things do have meaning to me. And this is a phrase from the Declaration of independence uh, from this country. And, you know, the wisdom of, of these authors at that time um, and never escapes me because in a few words, they always hit it. They always hit it uh, very correctly in terms of what the real issue was. And I uh, sort of highlighted this one phrase that has always caught my attention. And the, the phrase is that of deriving their just powers from the consent of the government. In other words, the, the actual sentence here, very early in this document, was, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. And, you know, it keeps hitting me years after years after years when you ask why. Why are you having to do this? Why are you having to fight a campaign? Why are, why are you having to launch an, uh, uh, an organ, organized effort that takes years to even get your voice? And when, when you realize that no government exists without your own consent, these are the rules of the game. And if those rules are being violated, which they have been and are being violated, then it's up to each of us to assume that role, to realize that nothing in this government, theoretically at least, was supposed to happen, certainly on the scale we're talking about, without your consent. It doesn't exist. Um, it shows that there is a breakdown in the system, and we have to decide whether we're going to uh, put, put forth enough effort to hold on to it and value that which has been created for us, um, or simply act as a victim or in a responsive mode, you know, reactionary mode, rather than an assertive mode. So that being the opening uh, sort of soapbox on my side, it, it underlies things to me. I never forget where your power is truly coming from, and it is with uh, your consent. And if it does, if your consent is not there, uh, that power is unjust, basically. The other two topics that I at least wanted to introduce to, to you tonight. Oh, actually, there was another one there. That would be brief. Maybe it'll be four, if you remind me. Um, the second would be that uh, I was looking 
when Russ and I last spoke, and it was in February of this year. And at that time, I was making reference to a fact of a rather rather complex research project uh, that I was becoming involved in. And at that time, I was about four months into it. And I had posted the title of the paper, but I hadn't actually been able to write the paper at all. So I wanted to give an uh, update on that paper and what it's, in, what's it's involved. And it's sort of how I'm consumed these days. Uh, my time is just, it's just restricted. It just is, and becoming more so probably in the future. So if people are trying to contact me or something, and I'm simply not responsive, just realize I have to make choices with my time. And my priority right now is to finish a paper. And since Russ and I, Russ and I spoke, um, I have made some progress with this paper. It ends up right now, it's probably the most uh, probably the most complex of the papers that I have written. Uh, it's about uh, 70 pages long now. It is the longest one I've written. I, I would estimate that it's only about uh, two-thirds done, would be my guess. It has taken me roughly these six months, because I have to do this in what you call uh, separate time from regular living. Um, it's taken about the last four to five months since Russ and I spoke um, to get this much of the paper in place. And I do have the screen share running, and I hope that that will be available for the audience to see. I will make at least audio reference um, to uh, whatever I'm speaking about so you can at least look it up. Um, yeah, the screen share is working perfectly. That, that's great, uh, Russ. Thank you. There is a paper that I'm writing, and indeed it is on, quote, uh, the Margellan issue. Uh, but um, I, I wanted to tell you at least what this paper is generally about. And then have patience, because it'll probably be several more months before it's done. But the paper is important to me because it, it is representing a synthesis of basically several years of work on this issue. And the paper is naturally sort of evolving into three different phases. And the objective, the objective of this research project is to use an instrument that um, measures how matter, in this case a biological sample, um, responds to energy, the type of energy we're speaking about is infrared. And I won't go into all the details of that, which I think we did discuss uh, actually last time to some degree. But, but that's what's happening here. Is there, an there is an instrument that is capable of uh, responding to energy, and the material is being examined as a biological sample. The, um, and, and the biological sample is, for, for all intents and purposes, appears to be perfectly characteristic of that which is identified or in association with what's called Margellan's condition. It's an oral sample in this case. There's three parts to this paper. The first will be that of identification. Uh, by identification, what I mean, at, at least to the degree possible, there's there's a lot of ifs, there's a lot of caveats here, and I could talk about those forever tonight. But in a simple form, we're talking about at least the basic core uh, molecular and chemical composition of a biological structure. This is in the field of organic chemistry, and for those that are more um, experienced and knowledge than I, uh, they can contribute uh, their own work and or offer their criticisms as they see fit. But in the world of what is called organic, organic chemistry, you have what are known as functional groups. And functional groups are, are, are the building blocks of life, what it amounts to. It's what we're made of on a fairly coarse level, but nevertheless very important. Um, functional groups are at the heart of the reactions that take place in the process of life. So if you have a means of learning what the what the functional groups within a biological structure are, then you have some very important information um, uh, 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 that you can use to determine what type of uh, reactions might take, be taking place, what kind of processes uh, might be affected um, within that uh, life form. In this case, uh, we're talking about the human being, folks, it's us that we're talking about. So. It's obviously very valuable and important information if you can get it accurately. Um, and this is what I have attempted to do uh, with a 
uh, it's an older instrument that we have, uh, but it's very functional. It took me three days to get her working, uh, but it's quite functional, and that information is coming forward. And the paper that's on the screen share, um, that title would have been up there when Russ and I talked, but um, um, in the center there, when that shows up, there, hopefully you'll see a graph. And don't worry about interpreting that now. It's way too much information. But, but basically, this is that first phase of the paper, that of identification. I would guess about 30 or about half of the 70 pages right now is devoted to that process. I know it's tedious. Uh, none of this is necessarily fun to read. You can look for the highlights if you'd like to. Um, that's fine. But I can't give you the highlights unless I do the work. And that's what the paper is about. Hopefully, you can find uh, information that has some meaning to you. So, that process has taken place, and that portion of the paper has been written up in terms of what does it appear that these primary functional groups are, um, as, as well as at least an introduction uh, to some of the reactions and processes that might take place if you had such uh, functional groups. What would you expect? might happen um, within the body. That, that part is written up. So that's a, that's a core piece of uh, information, uh, not a really a piece, but a body of information that I hope will be helpful to us. And everything that I do is, is pretty much a stepping stone um, to what needs to come afterwards. It's, uh, uh, there's so much more that could be done, but it's a start, and I hope it's valuable. The second phase of this paper, which I am just sort of reaching the tail end now, uh, is that of potential health effects. Now, my caveat is all over the place on everything I write. Uh, not a doctor, uh, giving no medical advice. You can read the caveat at the beginning of every paper. I'm a researcher. Uh, my information only comes to you as an informational source, um, and, and the caveats are, are well declared, so I won't get into all that tonight. But from a research point of view, not everything, listen, we're all entitled to do research, folks. We're all entitled to educate ourselves. And we don't always need uh, a, quote, um, authoritative source uh, telling us which way the wind is blowing us, still on his tell us. Um, I am going through that process myself and sharing that with you. But when you learn about these functional groups, you will see that there are, there are you could say, potential you could say likely, you could say possible, you could say expected. It could be any or all of these, portion or all of these, in terms of health effects or impacts upon the body and or life form that would, like, that would be expected to take place or might take place if these functional groups um, were to exist. So that's what the whole second part of this paper is about, probably the second half of uh, this effort. And you will see in the second half, there is basically um, an analysis that takes place of saying, well, if you had, and I'll try to get one on the screen here, this is an example. I, like, I know people like to see pictures more, but I'll have to produce uh, a table here. Yeah, so this would be one um, that'll show up hopefully after a little bit. But this will be a case where the approach is as follows. If you have such and such a functional group present, what might be the health effects that might be associated with that? And so on this paper at the beginning is an example of what might happen uh, if you started finding iron in something, the metal iron uh, within a structure. What might that mean for the body? And I'm not going to go into this detail tonight because we won't have time, but I want to let you know that such a table exists. And I have created, I've gone through every functional group. There's close to a dozen of them, I would say, somewhere in the 8 and 12 uh, that I'm focusing on. They all have their own story to tell in terms of potential health implications. And so I've given an example of one table. This actually did not result from infrared with the iron. This, this uh, happened from earlier work. This paper actually represents, like I said, a synthesis of years of previous work as well as what's happening now. But iron is the first one, and so that's why that's on there. Um, you will see through this paper, you will progress through all of the functional groups and what those health associations and implications are. Now, now before, before you get to this stage in the paper, you will also 
find another part that precedes this. And this will be a list to the best of, call it our knowledge, my knowledge, however you want to say it, the, the uh, Institute's uh, knowledge, the public's knowledge as I can see it, a list of the symptoms and health effects that are identified in association with, a quote, I keep saying quote because that's a term that's uh, sort of uh, wrought with its own difficulty, but nevertheless, more gallons condition. Symptoms and health impacts from the more gallons condition, a listing of all the primary health effects and impacts that are known. So that precedes this, okay? Then each uh, functional group is listed, and you'll find separately for them the health effects that occur for each one. Now, I'm hoping you might get an idea of where this paper is going um, at this second phase, but the end uh, product of the second phase of this paper will be a listing of all functional groups combined, all health impacts, potential, expected, possible, however you want to say it, along with them, with the redundancies of those eliminated. So we basically have a congregate set of, from strictly a research point of view of health impacts in association with uh, observed or identified functional groups. That is the end goal of Phase two, and what should interest, what should start to capture people's interest at that point, is the level and degree of correspondence between that final tally of uh, potential health impacts from the analytic, analytical and research side based upon use of this instrumentation. The correspondence of that list with the original list of symptoms as they are reported and known to exist. Uh, there is no way of denying that that should, I think, be a focal point of interest for people. Uh, admittedly, it will take you 70 pages um, to get to that point where you're seeing that list, and you will probably have to back up 20, 30 pages to, to get to the original list which precedes it. Um, and maybe sometime I'll include it in the paper, that actual comparison. I'm sure I'll make a statement about it. That's about where I'm at at the paper right now. But that would be your hint, would be to look for that degree of correspondence. And I will say at this point that there's no way denying that there is a rather exhaustive um, um, direct correlation um, between these two lists. Um, exhaustive. Uh, I'm not even sure how many of the lists are left out, to tell you the truth. It looks like by far the vast majority of them do appear to be included. Again, no medical advice being given here. Uh, that's phase two. The third phase, which is not complete yet, which I hope to um, develop over the next several months as I have uh, some time, uh, is, uh, let's see, the title of this section would be something to the effect of uh, potential uh, mitigating strategies. That will be the title. Again, no medical advice being given, but from a research point of view, um, I will be offering um, the results of my research that would say, okay, uh, given this situation, if such and such were happening, what might we do about it um, to help ourselves? And, you know, I'll get off my diatribe later. It'll, it'll probably come. I'll try to avoid it. But I'll give you a hint in terms of uh, the attitude that is underlying this paper. And that is, if, if anybody wants a pill to take to solve their problems in life on this issue, I'm not the person to come to. Uh, first of all, I wasn't the doctor, so I wasn't, get, I wasn't going to give you a pill anyway. Uh, but you're not going to get a nice, simple, easy answer from me. Uh, sorry, it's just not going to happen. But by the same token, I think that if you're willing uh, to educate yourself uh, with this information and complement it with your own studies, that I'm hoping that what I would call a rational sort of approach uh, towards improvement uh, of the general health of an individual may indeed be a very serious prospect for you. Um, and that's certainly my hope and intent of the uh, of the research. So that's what is happening um, in the background. And like I say, at the rate I'm going, it'll be several months. Uh, if 
you do want to help, I'm sure Dane could use it too. Uh, listen, our organization needs help, needs all the help in the world. I tell the staff over and over, I could use a couple hundred folks. You guys are working as hard as you can. I appreciate it very much, but I could use a couple hundred of you. We probably have a dozen folks. There is no limit um, to the amount of work, the amount of resources that are needed. This is a 1983 instrument I'm using, folks. You want to get with it, uh, get us to a point where we have something made in the 20th century, uh, okay, that talks to a computer that doesn't have, have me having to figure out how to get a ballpoint pen attached to the thing and stick in my own paper instead of talking to a computer. Um, listen, we're making great progress, but if you really want to assume your responsibility, um, support those that you think are, are doing uh, good work wherever that's uh, coming from and assume your responsibilities that you have to help get the answers, but I will continue to do the best that I can. But in the real world, I'm dealing with 1983 technology here when we should be 30 years ahead of time. Um, I think that would be the end of two. I hope I'm not taking up too much time, Russ. Um, I have two more topics that at least would like to mention. Is that going to be okay with you and your audience? Yeah, that's perfectly fine. Go right ahead. Okay, thank, thank you, Russ. The two other topics would be, I'm going to show a photograph if I can get this to working. Now, this is actually a preview. Um, this is a photograph of something that you probably won't see me writing up for at least four months down the road. I don't know when it is. By the way, I'm, I'm moving to folks. I'm going up to the northern part of the country. The industry will still carry on, but I've got some uh, major changes happening in my life. And they're voluntary, uh, but I am moving. So you pro be between that and the amount of work I have to do on this paper, you probably will not see this photograph showing up on a paper for several months from now. But I will give you a little heads up as to something you're going to see. And this is a photograph that has been received, uh, call it with the assistance of some helpful people, of an electron microscope photograph. This photograph has been in the waiting, in my mind, for close to 15 years. Uh, what you are seeing, if the screen comes through, is an electron, high quality electron uh, uh, microphotograph of the infamous, what I call, environmental filament um, that many of us may be familiar with that I make reference to repeatedly in my talks, uh, going back to the Environmental Protection Agency and their failure uh, to identify uh, this very substance back in 1999, as well as a false uh, lab report uh, given to me in the year 2000 is also available on the website for you to read. By the way, the website where the body of research is available is at uh, carnicominstitute.org, and you will find a research uh, library uh, button there, and that's where you'll find the 300 plus papers that are available uh, to you uh, for your information. This uh, photograph that you're seeing has a history, uh, a secret history that goes back um, close to 15 years now. And all I can say is that, uh, I want to say, I'm not surprised by what I see, um, and yet, by the same token, it confirms all of the analysis that I have been involved in over the years, all of the statements that have been made with respect to size and measurements and uniqueness of the material. Um, it all is uh, what I would call evident. Uh, within this photograph and will be more so um, as I write about. And actually what I will be doing is starting a research project on several of these filament samples. It will probably consume me for another six months of my life. Um, just by, this is not meant to um, um, sort of uh, confuse anybody, but just so you know, in turn, my life is changing, okay? I've been doing this 15 years. I'm not going to be in the same position my whole life. The next year and a half, just so the public knows, are a rather <coughs> critical period, and, and is a rather critical period in terms of my availability uh, to do research if the public wish to support it. Uh, we've got about a year and a half where I know that I can uh, sort of devote myself should the means uh, become available. I can't necessarily say exactly uh, at what level that would occur, will occur after that I know it won't dissolve, but this is a rather crucial period of remaining in my life, <coughs> um, excuse me, um, to get some important work done as the public thinks it's deserving of being done. Uh, but this uh, this photograph is is a history, has a history of over a dozen years, and there are important important ramifications to this photograph that you're seeing. Um, okay, 
the last topic that I wanted to make you aware of is um, a paper, and one of our um, staff consultants basically uh, brought this to my attention. I was familiar with it. They brought, reminded me, basically, of a paper that um, I saw about three months ago, and uh, he wanted me to remind, uh, sort of bring it up tonight. And I think it's a good topic because these kind of things are happening in the background. And I just don't have time to keep up with them all. I, I like to say, I've got to write this paper. It's what my job is now. But there is a rather interesting uh, paper um, that appeared. I actually don't even know the source of it. I know it's posted on a website. But I don't actually know the true source of it. And uh, there will be, you know, uh, authenticity issues that will always need to be resolved at some point. Um, I've made some initial initial reviews of this, and I'll bring up the title page here um, so we can see it. Yeah. So here's the title page to this, and it's entitled. Uh, let me go to the second page because I know that comes directly from it. The title page of this is "Future Strategic Issues: Future Warfare, circa 2025." Now, this uh, it's a briefing paper to me. Uh, I used to see this kind of work, or I used to work. Uh, it has all the classic signs of a, of a briefing paper. Uh, this one has the NASA stamp on it, and it has a name attached to it. Uh, this is an interesting paper because the truth is, I'm not, how would I say it this way? Maybe this was intended to be a public document, but if it is, I, it's more than interesting, I'll say that. I wouldn't expect to see uh, some of the information on this paper in the public circles. Uh, everybody can judge for itself, and I've only I've only just made a cursory uh, a scan, basically, of this document, but it's a little bit mind-blowing. Uh, what I have done is trace down this individual on the, on the name of this document. At this point, it appears to be authentic uh, to me, from what I can see. And there's a name out here, Dennis Bushnell, on there, Chief Scientist, NASA Langley Research Center. Well, I've looked up this person, and indeed, he exists. Uh, he would be in the role of... Um, Presenting this type of information for sure. Langley is where the CIA is focused, in case you're not familiar with that. Uh, NASA Langley Research Center. And this is a fascinating document. Now, I don't have time to go through it, so I can only give you some clues. But I guess I would say it this way from my, from my scan of it. This would be that all the issues that we've been talking about for over a dozen years, both on, you know, on the analytical side of saying, you know, it looks like this would be possible. You know, Dane was alluding earlier to the applications, right? And I have my list of seven that I frequently quote. Uh, quote. And yet when you see this paper, it's like, you know, my seven would actually be a rather limited subset. Not a bad list, by the way, uh, that evolved to work with. But there would be some things that would be a little bit more in the open than, my, than we might even expect um, within this document. But all of these sort of postulations and scenarios, the consideration that have evolved, um, you know, considering uh, warfare and psychology and, and uh, weapon systems and weather systems, basically those issues of control. It, it, when people really press me to the bone there and, you know, ask me, how do you, they always want to get the sound bite from me, and I'm just not very good at it. But when they force me, you will notice in those interviews, I will ultimately say, the word of uh, control, that if you had to sum this up, all that's going on, it appears as though the overriding objective is that of control, and control would be expressed really in all ways, uh, uh, physical, psychological, environmental, resource, uh, uh, financial, ultimately that control would be expressed at all levels. This document, from my standpoint, uh, confirms what I would call uh, worst person's fears in terms of the reality of scope of consideration, as well as, I have to use the word uh, deployment, that is expected to be um, in place. And it will be interesting whether, the, you know, this document uh, is determined that, you know, it should be out to the public if somehow it, it's not uh, released. Uh, someone sent an email uh, couple months also ago, also ago from uh, WikiLeaks uh, database um, where somebody done some good searching there. I just don't have time to recall that all now on the screen. But nevertheless, uh, 
what I'm going to do in terms of uh, sort of demonstrating what I see as the relevance of this document and that it's worthy at least of study uh, are about four slides. Okay, the, the, it's, two, it's 114 uh, pages or slides long. I'm going to uh, just show you about four of them. You see the title of it. You see who's pro uh, apparently produced the document. And um, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> sorry, I'm going to give you five or, five or six slides. Okay, I'm going to show you the first two pages there. Interesting titles going on. Uh, we saw the opening title, then we have a subtitle here called uh, The Bot. Borgs and humans welcome you to 2025 A.D. Bots and Borgs are in um, in uh, uh, quotes there. And um, I'm just reading this straight from the document. And I'll say this, none of it surprises me one bit, other than what I would call the openness or access to the information uh, appears to be somewhat anom anomalous to me. Uh, the actual content would not. But when you see words like this, uh, think about them, okay? If this is an authentic document, uh, you have an open declaration of all that has been perceived to be fully of interest, and this would be in the world uh, of artificial life, right, and, and uh, robots, and they're interfacing with humans, this type of thing, right? So there's your subtitle, the bots, orgs, and humans welcome you to 2025 AD, and then I'll give you the third one, and then I'll bring up those three or four slides. I do apologize if I go longer than anybody wants me to, but it's Hard. I'm, I'm actually summarizing. Well, no problem at all. No problem. Third one. Interesting. Um, look who it says is involved in this uh, document and the, and the projects. Again, wouldn't surprise me one bit, but the degree of, of public um, uh, revelation of this document certainly is interesting. It says this presentation is based on futures work for and with who? And, and here's a list of the folks. And who do you see? Uh, everybody under the intelligence umbrella and military umbrella you would ever expect to see, right? Absolutely everyone. Uh, I don't know all of them. I would know some of them, but, you know, of course, there's your Air Force, uh, NRO, National Reconnaissance Office, uh, DARPA, uh, DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency, right, CIA, uh, uh, and we'd have to, we get fun, we have some fun to look up all these acronyms and where they come from. But basically, it is the intelligence military network that appears to be um, uh, the associations that underlie this presentation. And again, it shouldn't be a surprise, but it should be, it's something that we may or may not have been aware of at this level of uh, directness. I'm going to present four slides. Uh, Obviously, to me, this whole document is worthy of an entire uh, review by itself. Um, but I'll give you at least three or four, just to just to sort of let you know. Oh, there, there's just great phrases in here. It, there's just great phrases. Here's another one. Look, I just read through these quickly. Look at this one. It's called the 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 uh, page is called Spaceship Earth. It says the crew are. So they're talking about inhabitants of the planet, right? The crew are plundering the ship's supplies, tinkering with the temperature and life support controls, still looking for the instruction manual, engaging in bloody skirmishes in every corner of the vessel, increasing the size of the crew by two million per week. Okay, um, so um, who's doing the plundering? Who's doing the tinkering? Uh, who's engaging in the bloody uh, skirmishes? The power structures are controlling, right? The power structure is control. So nothing that is expressed within this system of warfare analysis um, is separate from the power and control control structures that exist. So it's basically an admission of uh, direct engagement by those control and power systems. Going to go to 43. And 43, and these are just some phrases. Briefings are the highlights. This is what people like, are the sound bites. I tend to be interested in the, in the uh, story behind the sound bites, but here they are. Uh, it's actually, it's actually one more. There we go. All right, listen to this one. What it means is these are the topics of discussion interest. And the, and the briefing is presented in the vein that, well, this is where warfare is going. 
I would, all right, here's your, here's your, here's your issue. If somebody is saying this is war, where warfare is going, isn't it the responsibility and obligation of those that manage the military system to try and precede that by development of their own systems? Of course it is. And so if something is saying it's in the future, it is telling you that such systems are being designed now because they need to anticipate and precede those events. That's what the advantage in warfare is about. I'm not, you know, into the philosophical discussion. Listen, I work for the Department of Defense. I, 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 I'm not going to get into the philosophy of that, but uh, listen, uh, uh, defense is something that a, a person can owe their existence to. There's a difference between uh, defense and what you call exploitation and, and abuse of the human race, okay, and destruction of the human race and over warfare. There are differences. Um, each of you can decide how far we have crossed that line, and I won't get into the, to the uh, debate on that. But listen to this one, micro-dust weaponry. Here's the question. All right, all the folks that are saying, are you kidding? Are you kidding? You're talking about uh, aerosol, aerosol particulates in, in our atmosphere that somehow are affecting our health? Are you kidding? All right, here's why we're not kidding and why we haven't been kidding for 15 years. Here's the phrase. A, man, a, a mechanical analog to bio micron size mechanized dust, in quotes, which is distributed as an aerosol and inhaled into the lungs. The dust mechanically bores into lung tissue and executes various, quote, pathological missions, unquote. Phrase underneath, a holy, holy, this is W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy, new, new is in quotes, a wholly new class of weaponry, which is legal. Fascinating phrase. Fascinating phrase in there. Because you'll find, I can't find it right now. I know that I did see it before. I found this interesting ambiguity with respect to the use of the word legal in here. This place, they're saying, which is legal. There's another place in here where you'll find, uh, well, we'll see it. I think we'll see it today. Yeah, we'll see it on a later slide where the word apparently legal is used, <laughs> okay? Hey, what's the story here, folks? Is it legal or apparently legal? If it's legal, what's your basis of it? Now, it's fascinating that certain declarations are being made here, that certain things are illegal. Remember the phrase, consent of the governed, that we started with? What allows something to be legal? Three more to go. This one is on 51. I did a little homework for you. I didn't have as much time as I would like. Hey, Russ, I might want to, uh, um, sorry to interject. When you guys do get done, though, I might, um, if we want to do some Q&A, I might need to get to that before I, I have a time window that I'm trying to work within, too. So anyway, sorry, Clifford, I don't mean to interrupt. But if you, um, whenever you think we can get that to that roster, I, might, I don't want to uh, exit without any Q&A for anybody. Yeah, not a problem. I think I'll be done in about uh, four minutes. Uh, no problem. I'm five. sorry to interject. I, I no, just didn't no, want no. to get off, get off the line yeah, no, without. No, that's fine. Yeah. And then we'll flip over, and then uh, I will have my piece, and hopefully people will have had some patience, and I thank you with it. Um, three more to go. Um, the title of this one is called Often, and they, you know, things are in quotes here, so you need to see that, because these words, they're in quotes for a reason. Often, quote, finger printless, unquote, bio archipelago. What a fascinating phrase, right? You're talking about a soup, a soup of biology that you cannot trace down. That's what the phrase means. And go ahead and read the list, and you'll see you'll see uh, quite an interesting list, right? Bacteriological, viruses, prions, uh, prions either way, parasites, fungi, carcinogens, toxins, hormones, regulators, fatal disabling, short to long-term kills. Anyway, won't go into it, but uh, bio archipelago. Okay. Um, again, um, idea or reality, patent or deployment. 53 is the next, it looks like they're all one over where I, oh yeah, this was just a phrase, this is something due down in Venezuela. There are some interesting uh, programs in here that are referenced too that are also worthy of investigation for authentication, but they're quite open with what they're saying. This is a biological uh, program down in Venezuela. Uh, where the phrase is specifically stated, tested on humans. 
Operation White Coat. I don't know what Operation White Coat is yet, but an open declaration of a uh, human testing program involving uh, encephalitis uh, down in Venezuela. And the last one is, uh, ah, yes, yes, yes. Okay, great place to end this then. Remember I was talking about legal? Look at the title of this. The title of this uh, slide is called, What is Apparently Legal? And now legal is put in quotation marks. And I won't go through them all. It'll hopefully it'll be recorded on the list, but basically you will see weapon systems and psychological systems, uh, chemical systems. Um, and then at the very bottom, you see again the repeat of that very interesting phrase, mechanical micro dust. Um, so my objective tonight was simply to make you aware of these four issues. Uh, obviously, each of them is worthy of their own discussion in its full right, but uh, hopefully I at least uh, sort of set again uh, a door for you for things that are actively uh, what I think are worth looking at, and hopefully the paper that will probably have close to a, close to a nine months to a year of time invested in it before it's all over uh, will be of value to all of us. And with that, uh, my thanks uh, both to Russ and Dane, as well as the audience for their uh, patience and tolerance. Clifford, thank you so much. Um, we, I, I am going to uh, ask you at any time in the future that you're available. I would love to have you come in and focus on any of these areas that you would like to bring to the public's attention and let you cover it, uh, you know, uh, at a level of thoroughness that you would, would like to. So uh, the door is open, and, and I hope we can chat about that because I would love to see you get this information out. I really appreciate it. All right, for those, I want to get to question and answer right away. Q&A session started. So now, if you have called into the console, you can actually press star six on your phone, and then you can ask Dane or Clifford any questions you want. This is your opportunity to uh, to talk to two of the masters, two of the, uh, the most uh, uh, researched, the most knowledgeable people about these fields that you will have an opportunity to talk to. So... Uh, call in. We already see people are lining up, so let's get right to it. When you state your question, please state your question quickly and concisely so we can get to everyone who has a question, because I do believe there's going to be many, so let's move right along and try to get the information out. So let's go ahead and uh, just uh, when you ask your question, just if you have, if you want to direct it to one of our guests, uh, just state who you're directing it to and then quickly uh, state your question for us. Thanks so much, and here we go. Uh, good evening, caller. You're live. Yeah, hi, it's Mark, uh, Dane, Clifford, thank you so much for taking the time for us this evening. Uh, question, Dane, could you reiterate or give us a little uh, synopsis of the implications for methane release? I believe, is that related to the melting of the Arctic ice caps? Oh, I apologize. Uh, I think I have, let me make sure I can get Dane and Clifford back connected here. Uh, my bad. Sorry about that, Dane. Uh, <laughs> Let's see. Um, my apologies. Go ahead, Dane. Okay. Uh, you got me now, Russ? Yep, you're live. Okay. Mark, thanks for the question. Um, when I mentioned earlier on the quick rundown, the ramifications from the loss of the Arctic ice cap, those ramifications are very, very dire. And, yes, methane is releasing. The last report we had from, from on-site, I think data is being now actively kept from the net was a Russian research vessel December 2010. They were seeing plumes of methane from the sea floor a kilometer wide. They were seeing thousands of these plumes. The East, Ar East Siberian Shelf of the Arctic was literally boiling with CH4, which is methane expulsion from the sea floor. And we see correlating methane atmospheric saturation. As of about a week ago, uh, the atmospheric methane has been measured at 1,800 ppb, 1,800 parts per billion. The highest it has ever been measured with paleo data in the last 500,000 years is 800 ppb. So we are already far in excess of that. And again, methane over a 10-year time horizon, 100 times more potent than CO2 as a greenhouse gas. So we are literally covering the planet with a layer of glass that will allow heat in but not allow it to escape. That is one of the primary reasons I believe the geoengineers are now going for broke in, a, in a, an effort that is 
causing even more destruction, adding even more fuel to the fire. They're trying to keep that last bit of ice uh, in the Arctic. And again, based on available data right now, it appears as if at minimum right now, based on the rate of release, the probable continuance of that, the amount of uh, feedback mechanism that's triggering, based on data I recently looked at and conclusions from some of the top people in the field, it looks like there's about 70 feet of sea level rise already built into the scenario we have, 70 feet. To add to that, again, to give overall figures, if Greenland melts completely, that's 21 to 24 feet of sea level rise, depending on the model. Antarctica, another 197 feet. The rest of the globe's glaciers, another 10 to 15 feet. We are guaranteed, I believe, at this point, a planet that is very different than the one we have known. But quite simply, if geoengineering doesn't stop, because now we have the shredding of the ozone layer, thwarting of the hydrological cycle, we have imploding atmospheric oxygen content. The ramifications from that should be clear to all. We have oceans that are acidifying from many causes, but the methane release is greatly adding to that. Uh, we truly have a dire situation. So it, again, at face value, um, one has to really look at geoengineering as being something that must be stopped if, if the planet's going to be allowed to maintain life at all. The methane issue is a global game-changing event, Mark. And uh, by itself, I, I believe it cannot be hidden much longer, uh, perhaps not even past the end of this year. I, it, it's hard to tell, but uh, that is a global game-changing event. I hope people look into methane, Arctic methane emergency. Thank you, Dave. Awesome. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate the question. Uh, next caller, uh, thanks for being on. Yes, thank you. My first question is for Dane to segue about the methane question. You had mentioned in the past that they had planned on dissipating the methane and I guess my question specifically was, if that, would that be some kind of you know, directly removing hydrogen through carbon on a molecular level? Uh, or or if, you, if you understood what exact mechanism that was, and I had a question for Mr. Karnik, Dr. Karnikarn as well. Um, so, Dane, I guess I'll, I'll take your answer, please. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, we, we believe they may already be at this. It's, it's called Project LUCY. The acronym is L-U-C-Y. And this involves the use of the globe's ionosphere heaters, the HARP facilities, which we, we now believe there's as many as 26 around the globe. I, I've been holding to the figure of 18, but it looks like there may be 26. And that might not be counting the mobile units. So to use these ionosphere heaters to basically hit the methane as it's releasing, and this is a form of nuking the atmosphere, if you will, with opposing frequencies to try to, to degrade the methane at a molecular level. That's how desperate they are. The other two proposals I've seen from, I, I don't know how these people can call themselves scientists, I truly don't, but the other two proposals I saw from the people in the AMIC group, the Arctic Methane Emergency Group, were to take 1,000 um, ton sheets of plastic, four square kilometers, with 200 ton stainless steel rims, and try to cap this on the seafloor. I mean, this, this is completely sci-fi. I mean, just at face value would be horrifically impossible to do. That's how desperate they are. So, um, yes, they, they do appear to be trying to deal with this issue, but uh, frankly, there's nothing that looks even remotely plausible for, for being able to cope with it, other than um, shutting down the geoengineering and bringing this issue to light so that it can be dealt with and letting the planet respond and hoping and praying for the best because our, our situation is indeed uh, dire and the methane is a huge part of that. Thank you very much, Dane. Uh, my next question is for uh, Clifford Carnicorn. Mr. Carnicorn, um, it, in, in communicating with one of your volunteers, you mentioned that you needed new equipment. You had mentioned your equipment was outdated. It occurs to me it would be a great conversation starter if you were to post maybe PDS, we need this, we need that to cut through something 200 times stronger than steel to get at the fragile bio goo, uh, you know, within, like, you know, opposing forces. And I mean, wow, maybe get a donation, maybe some university kicked down from the 90s or something, even just, just a thought. Is it secret exactly what you're doing? Is it an, an industrial secret that would be unrealistic or another time hassle for you, perhaps? Uh, I'll take my answer. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you very much. And by the way, Russ and Dana, if you'd like to defer the questions to Dana first, because of time limitations, that's absolutely fine with me, and I'll come back at the end. Uh, but in brief answer to this one, um, I guess um, what I would say to start with is, is nothing I do is a secret, absolutely nothing. 
uh, everything I do is completely open to the public. Uh, there are no secrets, quote, that I hold. Uh, everything that I have time to uh, develop and offer, I, I do so, and I do so without uh, inhibition or uh, uh, call it uh, uh, review uh, or approval uh, by others. So that's the answer to that in terms of the need for uh, resources and support. Um, uh, uh, the, the folks on our staff are uh, attempting to help in that process more so all the time. There's only so much I can do. This is why the nonprofit exists. And that process has, process has already started. Um, the next newsletter that's coming out, uh, I think, will give even some more detail uh, on um, what are some of the specifics that are needed. Um, you know, immediately. So, so hopefully that information um, continues, basically. It's not though it hasn't been there in some way, but hopefully it continues to be refined. And I'm pretty much uh, completely dependent uh, upon the staff to help me get that uh, word out. Um, as it is, like I say, my time is, is very much devoted to this particular paper now. So I hope that helps a little bit, and thank you for asking and making the topic known to people. Very good, yes, and we'll try to, uh, I, I realize there's some people in the queue, but if you have questions for Dane, it would be great to uh, take those first if we can. Um, but nevertheless, we'll move through the queue and get your questions I'm answered. I'm very sorry to interrupt you before, Clifford. Clifford I'm, I'm probably good till about 7, but I, I was sorry to interrupt you before. I, I just didn't want to leave before I had another appointment. And Anyway, we'll, we'll make, make do as best we can. But I, I apologize for interrupting your order. Yeah, no, not, not, a, not a problem at all. It's fine to me. I'm in no rush in my life, so it's just... Uh, I just um, had another appointment. I'm trying to... I'm kind yeah. of stacking things up this day. No, I mean, look what we did. Look what we did to get here. So I'm, I'm grateful. I'm no grateful worries. that we no made worries. it. So, we'll so we'll keep working together. Go yeah, ahead. yeah. No, go for it. Go ahead, Ron. Absolutely. Okay, well, we've got another caller. Uh, you're on. Go ahead and ask your question. Hi, this question is for Dane. And thanks, Russ, for a great show. Dane, um, I live about 50 miles northwest of you, and I just wanted to acknowledge what you were touching earlier today about the dramatic and, and clearly apparent effect the, the spraying that occurred just prior to this supposedly uh, uh, the rainfall predicted storm that has just is absolutely nothing. They were calling for an inch and a half of rain over in Mount Shasta. You've maybe seen a tenth of an inch to this point. You know, I wonder if the, if the weathermen, the local weathermen, are are um, keeping quiet. How can they make decisions and, and not um, um, know that something else is is, is up? And um, you know, we've got farmers here, alfalfa farmers. Okay, caller, your audio is cutting in and out. Um, what can you might want to just state your question? Maybe we can understand what your question is. I caught most, I, I'm catching most of it. Yeah, the audio is pretty rough, but I'm catching most of it. Go okay. Ahead. Well, you know, this is on the local effect. It seems like what we're talking about is on the local, uh, extreme, and with so many different factions, so many different interests involved. How can we best uh, fight fight this? And you know that. You fight one company and uh, one faction, and then there's another one lined up. Uh, what, what are we doing? We get this issue to critical mass with the public at large, and the dominoes will fall by themselves if we could just reach critical mass. As far as these local weathermen, which I, I think I heard you say in, in the course of the audio breakup, I believe they know. And I, I had a debate on a radio There was it was very short as I, I was cut off the air. And I, I've just posted an article on this on our site called Climate, Quote, Scientists, Arrogance, and Lies. And I, I was on with a scientist from the University of British Columbia, and his name, his name is Simon Donner. And he stated on the air, quote, there are no chemicals in the trails, nothing is being sprayed. This is a blatant lie. Now, Look, this guy, and what I, how I categorize this in the article I wrote, is, you know, this recognized ex expert, he's either clinically blind or he's a blatant liar. You know, this is, uh, these people definitely acknowledge, and I, and emails before this with these globally recognized climate scientists, they make clear, they made clear to me in an email, which some of which I quote in this article, that unless or until geoengineering is recognized in one of their ordained 
peer-reviewed manuals, which are basically manuals put out by the power structure itself, unless or until geoengineering is recognized in any such manual, it does not exist. It is not a reality. And this is the sort of people we're fighting. And, and they, they will never come out of their bubble, I believe, until they are forced out. And if we can simply bring this to life, for all those farmers that you speak of, and we're reaching a lot of farmers in our area now, too, that are realizing that everything they love, everything they live for is being decimated from top to bottom. If we can all pull together and keep sending out these flaming arrows, keep passing data onto these farmers, don't just point at the sky and rant, get some flyers. We have some good flyers on our site now. We, we send out for just the cost of what it takes to make them and handle them and send them out. Those work a lot better than a rant. There, I, I just completed a new PowerPoint that tries to give an A to Z on this. Keep sending out those flaming arrows because the climate is coming unraveled so quickly. I don't think they can hide this much longer. Obama's going to go into a rant tomorrow to try to uh, elaborate on uh, some scheme or another to, you know, completely divert people. But I don't think they can hide it much longer. So if we continue to plant the seeds, when they try to sell this to us as a cure, enough people will already know it's a curse far worse than the disease. And uh, I think at that point, the dominoes will start to fall. So if we can just reach public awareness, I believe the rest will take care of itself in regard to geoengineering. Yeah, well said, well said. I, I uh, want to get to our next caller, too. And uh, if, you have, if your questions are not for Dane, uh, then we'll just defer them till just a minute after because Dane is going to have to cut out shortly. But Clifford will be able to stick with us a little longer. So thanks for your question, caller. Appreciate that. And uh, next question, caller, you're on. Hello, Dane. This is uh, David from Connecticut. Um, Absolutely. I've been talking about, hey, how you doing? I've been uh, talking about chemtrails for years, uh, and I am encouraged that uh, people are starting to wake up uh, quickly, which is good. I hand out flyers all the time, and and uh, that's encouraging people to say, you know, what what can I do? And I'm just saying, just make people aware, and and, and I agree. My, my question is, I'll get right to it. Um, like a year ago and, and before, they would, they would spray heavily just before a rainstorm, you know, it would rain, and then they wouldn't spray for a couple of days. But now, 26, 27, 28 days a month, they're spraying all the time. Rain doesn't matter. We have like one, two, like in June, or well, in May, we had two sunny days. And every other day was just complete chemtrails. So, what, what you know, why, why do they take two days off? Or, I guess that's my question, why do they... Are they spraying all the time now, or are they just like, manipulate the weather? Um, I'm just looking to try to figure out a, a pattern of some sort. They're spraying as much as they possibly can with the resources that they have. And when you see them gone for a day or two, it's simply because they can't cover every place every day all the time. And the reason they're doubling down is our climate system is imploding. And I know there are still many who don't believe this or believe that I'm wrong in this regard, but I, I stand on all available data. I look from all available sources, and I, I have no bias. I simply look at the data. The fact that the ice cap is imploding and the methane is expelling, it's starting to release from other places around the globe. A huge methane release off the Carolinas about a week ago. The atmosphere is saturating by the day. The reality we have known will not be much longer. That doesn't mean that the planet cannot sustain life. In the Pliocene epoch, that's an era in Earth's history 5.2 million years ago, carbon counts were 20% or more higher than they are today. But the western U.S. was very lush because the hydrological cycle, the rain cycle, was not being thwarted by constant atmospheric saturation with particulates. So again, what these people are trying to do amongst a whole, uh, there's a long list. I mean, in eugenics is perhaps probably one of uh, the things on the list, uh, certainly Clifford is completely right that the power and control is ultimately at the bottom of all this. But in regard to power and control, they are trying desperately to keep business as usual, to keep from panicking the herd. You know, once people know the sea levels are going to rise um, in measures of tens of meters or more, uh, that changes the face of the planet. So they are trying to obscure this issue and, and hold it off as long as possible, but doing uh, much more harm in the process. So uh, that's the reason you see any open days is because they simply can't cover everywhere all the time. But the ice is melting, for example, in the, in the sea ice, it's melting almost two to one rate from underneath. The oceans are warming. That's why we see total coverage on much of the oceans, especially in the Pacific. And so storms can't develop and uh, the hydrological cycle is thwarted. 
Again, these guys are covering every inch of real estate they possibly can, and that is going to increase until we can bring this to light and people can face the fact that what we have known is now no longer possible and that we, we do face a different planet, period. It's locked in. But if they stop these programs, the planet could still likely sustain life, and that's how serious our situation is. It's not a matter of convenience. It's a matter of sustaining life, period. To back up what Dane is saying, uh, I have a lot of people contact me about the activity in their area, and I do notice that I'm on the East Coast here in Maine. When we're getting hit hard, sometimes in the West Coast, oftentimes in other parts of the United States, they're having some very light days. When we have some breaks, they're getting hit real hard. Plus, the U.S. government has got a contract. It was originally a split contract between Airbus and Boeing. I think it's been switched switch to Boeing exclusively to build 179 uh, more tankers. All right, Dane's got to go in a second. Let me see. Uh, you just let me know when you need. I, I'm okay to answer the questions, though, as long as they're there. If I, it's always the case, though, as you said, Russ, that they're, uh, you see, you can see an event, for example, if they're spraying as heavy in the Pacific Northwest, and once hurricane season starts, if a, if a significant cyclonic rotation kicks up, they're gone. They're gone from here. So quite simply, they're covering as much as they can, and they'll continue to build tankers. They'll continue to uh, uh, increase the saturation over us until until we raise awareness to the point where those within the system realize they're killing themselves, they're killing their own children, and they cease to participate. We must reach that point, and we don't have much time. Time is not on our side. Yeah, and this isn't going away. Thank you for that call, that question, caller. Uh, next caller, you're on. Okay, uh, this is Lindy. I am... TN Mama Bear on YouTube, a very close friend of mine on YouTube, a cyber warrior, and he's been sounding the alarm for a while about the methane. And you're the first one, Dane, I've heard to hammer at home just how important this is and how critical. Um, what I like, number one, is if you've got your website, if uh, you could please get that listed so everybody can go there afterwards and dig up more information and help spread it. Number two, something else he has proposed as a theory that I want to ask you about. With everything that's going on right now, he is wondering if our atmosphere itself is actually shrinking between HARP screwing around with all the different levels of our atmosphere and then monkeying around with the weather system. I know for a fact, I live here in Middle Tennessee, and I think we get hammered not just from direct trails being laid over my head that I see constantly, but also as it drifts through the, the system coming over us, because we're like right of center of the, of the continental United States. And there are days I go out, and it feels like I can't hardly breathe, like there's not as much oxygen. So is there anything else going on like our atmosphere itself is actually shrinking? And also, like I said before, if you have a website that people can go to, thanks. Great. Sorry, uh, sorry I haven't mentioned the website. That certainly would, should have been one of the first things I did. It's geoengineeringwatch.org, all one word, geoengineeringwatch.org. As far as an overall rundown on this, I, I just posted the uh, recording of a live presentation I did in Northern California. People can Google this. It's called The Most Important Topic of Our Time. They can go straight to geoengineeringwatch.org. It's also posted on the front. I don't know that I would term it as atmospheric shrinking, but atmospheric oxygen content is plummeting. There are very direct reasons for that. Yes, the, the gases that are entering the atmosphere react with oxygen and reduce the overall oxygen content. You also have a um, very rapid diminishment of the ocean's ability to produce oxygen. That's the single greatest oxygen producer on the planet. The latest count I saw on global plankton populations down 50 percent. This should alarm the hell out of people. The boreal forests, the terrestrial lungs of the planet, are in sharp, sharp decline. I live in one. I live in the middle of the wilderness. It is dying by the day. So again, the gravity of the geoengineering issue and its effect on every one of these ecosystems and, and literally the entire web of life, it, it cannot be overstated. And the, the struggle you find for air uh, certainly can be related to lungs that are being saturated with these particulates and a, a reduction in atmospheric oxygen. It is happening. So um, I, I salute your friend of, of sounding the alarm of the methane. I've had editorials published in papers here going back 10 years stating uh, the methane issue is unreported. I've been screaming at the top of my lungs on that issue. But so many people, because they don't like Al Gore, nor do I, have had trouble accepting the fact 
that the climate is damaged, very, very irreparably damaged in many ways. And geoengineering appears to be the single greatest causal factor, not the only factor. We have done great damage to the planet, period. And the carbon credits and all those scams, absolute, absolute BS, absolute, uh, they, they are scams. But that being said, damage has been done. It's going to affect the way you breathe. It's going to affect every life system there is, and, and, it, and it is already. So, we're, you know, back to exposing this issue. This should be the single greatest priority for people on the planet at this time. If we could bring this issue to light, it would change the flavor of what we face. Very good. Thank you, Dane. Thanks for, uh, and caller, thank you for that uh, that question. You just let me know when you need to run, Dane. Um, we've got a couple more people lined up. Try to catch a couple more before I go. I don't want to leave anybody hanging. Okay. Appreciate that. Caller, uh, you're on the line. Go ahead with your question. Try to keep it uh, concise if you can, please, but thank you for calling. Absolutely. Thank, thank you, Russ, for having a great show. Dane, a couple of questions. You mentioned uh, cyclonic rotation. Um, I live in South Florida, and we are getting hammered here every single day, 24-7. In fact, I'm in the process of getting out of here because I don't want to stick around for a hurricane season, been here 25 years. Um, and I also work in the health field. I find a lot of resistance trying to get this information out to my peers um, uh, and physicians. Uh, are there, do you have any encouragement and, and, and things that we can do as far as getting this information out, out to uh, the health officials? And with uh, the rising, what, what do you see yourself, Floyd? Do you feel that this area is going to be underwater here in the next several years? Sea level rise is increasing dramatically, and, and, and this this is not an, a linear equation. It's an exponential equation, and that, that rate of rise will increase dramatically. Dramatically on the, on the cyclonic rotations, it appears the experiment is changing constantly, that they are now allowing more convection to occur to get more moisture into the atmosphere. They're allowing more of these rotations to get going. And, and that's an engine by which they can pump more moisture in the atmosphere. And that's about the only way they could cool anything down at this point. They are artificially nucleating clouds, even now, even in late June, uh, three, four days ago over the panhandle of Idaho and Montana, clearly visible on the radar, artificially nucleating the precipitation. Now, it's not hitting the ground as frozen precipitation, but it is cooling the air masses below that precipitation. So this is, uh, again, their how desperate they are to try to cool things off anywhere they can, anytime they can, at the cost of making the overall situation worse. But they don't care. We know in what short terms they think. So uh, do I think it's going to continue in the direction it is where you live? Yes. As far as uh, introducing the, the professionals you mentioned, I would strongly recommend the, like the flyers. Some people in, in Arizona helped put together a flyer that's on our site. Russ has good flyers. You can make your own flyer, but give them a good flyer instead of trying to verbally deliver anything. The PowerPoint is a recent update. Hopefully that will be a, a good tool. And uh, I would actually put data in their lap and walk away, let them look at it themselves. It just has to sink in. This is awfully hard to get your arms around, but if you plant the right seeds, uh, they're going to find fertile ground soon enough because quite simply, the unraveling of the climate cannot be hidden much longer. Great. Thank you, caller. appreciate that uh, question. Uh, next caller, you're on. Yeah, I um, just wanted to uh, comment on the uh, the clouds. I'm seeing um, them building, it seems to me, like cumulus clouds um, with either no trails or smaller trails uh, here in New York. And I just wanted to see if you've noticed that. Great. Thank you, Colin. Go ahead, Dane. Yeah, I, I, if you, now, on that note, I mean, we're seeing the experiment change all the time. And many people think if you don't see the horizon, the horizon trails, there's no spraying going on. But you have... A number of other methods. You have the, the CARE program. That's, a, that's a, quite an acronym for uh, it's Chemical Aluminum Release Experiment. And uh, <laughs> I don't know how they could put the CARE acronym on that, but that's a detonation. We see sometimes on the radar, you'll see it just a donut shaped detonation that appears on the radar. And the, the meteorologist will typically just pretend it's not there. But uh, without seeing the spray trails, uh, depending on how many particulates they have, depending on what they're able to do now with the RF technology to coagulate those particulates in a certain area where there's convection occurring, uh, you might see such cloud buildup without seeing a lot of visible spraying. And, and again, we can't know the full depth of their technology. We cannot. They're probably far ahead of where uh, we think they are, but uh, certainly we know 
the basics, and the basics should scare the hell out of us and, and call us all to action. So, yes, you're probably seeing different things. We probably will continue to see different things as they continue to experiment. Great. Thank you. Um, all right. Next call. Uh, whoop, I'm sorry. Yep. Next caller. You're in. Uh, you're on. Go ahead. Next caller from 207. Uh, are you with us? Oh, I think we lost the call. Uh, let me give it one more shot here. Uh, caller, can you hear me? Oh, okay, let me just try something here real quick. Uh, uh, let me see. If we can... session is over. Let me see if we can. Get... The... Okay, call it. Yeah, you're live. I can hear you now. I was going to get an echo there. Okay. Hey, 207, you're on. Go ahead. Hi, thank you for um, giving me a chance for questions and answers with Dane. Um, Dane, I had a, a basic question, but it may be a complicated answer, but um, I hear a lot of excitement in your, in your voice when you talk about reaching critical mass, and for me, that's my biggest thing that I'm desperately trying to obtain, and I find that people in my area are completely unaware of so much as obvious as it, as it really is. And so I've been doing everything I can to pass out flyers. I've done pretty ingenuitive um, things to get the word out. And it seems as though still no one is aware. And I'm just trying to figure out, are there any kind of other ways I can get people together so that I can inform them instead of just reaching one or two people here and there by shouting in the middle of a parking lot, oh, look at that. I mean, that's one person that's not going to cut it. Which is always tempting to do. It's, it's, it's always tempting to do that, though. I understand the ears. <laughs> I, well, I mean, I get a little bit foolish with it sometimes. Like I, since I had no money at all, I I went to the, I checked out the end end geoengineering sign and I totally loved it. Went to the dollar store, bought neon green poster board and a bunch of markers and hand drew the actual sign, and I kept it on my in my windshield everywhere I went. Whenever I parked my car, that baby was up. All winter long, actually. And I, I would I had, say this. Uh, well, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. The NGO engineering sign. I use it as a I mean, sun visor. <laughs> you know what? I mean, uh, all, all those things matter. On the flyers, some people in Arizona did a flyer for us that seemed to be particularly effective. It, a lot of color photos in the front. And where those are on, hard, on, on thick, glossy paper now, and the photos seem to, to really uh, be a key to the door that um, we, we didn't really... Uh, have on other flyers, so it, it is a quite well done flyer. Again, we, we're grateful to the folks in Arizona that, that really helped put that together. And our webmaster y Yvonne Noctegal, who's a who's an absolute saint, um, has helped with that too. And uh, you know, those are seem to be a pretty effective flyer. And also, if you, if you have email contacts with these people, you know, for for example, a PowerPoint or something like what we have posted now may be a great tool. And on top of this, no matter how ambivalent they seem. If you can simply plant those seeds, like passing out those flyers, the climate unraveling is happening so quickly that those seeds, even though they don't seem to sprout, will find fertile ground soon enough. That's they, why I they, do it. I mean, I actually went to Walmart, and I took my geoengineering sign. This baby's huge. I um, clothesline, clothespin clipped it to my baby stroller. Put that in the front of the stroller, tacked on two more really awesome flyers on the side, and went in and put flyers in all the grocery carts. Uh, and, and that was one of the you. things that I did. And then, I mean, I've gone and I've tickled them to telephone poles. Um, but the thing is, it's like I keep getting roadblocks. Like I talk to the, I talk to the town, where can I disperse flyers? How can I disperse flyers? You can't stick them on telephone poles because that's illegal. You can't um, pass them out anywhere basically anywhere at any time for any reason unless the business gives you permission to stand there and pass them out. So I'm thinking, well, I'm, I'm developing a PowerPoint to hold a public meeting, and I'm thinking I can call different churches or maybe schools to find out if they would allow me to use their hall or their air, maybe their, their room for an hour to hold a public meeting for a PowerPoint. But how do I reach people to get people into a public meeting? I'm thinking, well, well I contacted every single newspaper in the state written emails and ask them if they'd be interested. Plus, all of the radio network stations, um, not the actual radio stations, but the network owners, sent them information asking them if they could mention this. Um, because 
we have an event for August 25th in Portland, Maine, and I'm trying to get as many human bodies as I can. So when it comes to have I called everybody I can, written everyone I can, absolutely, but I'm still not finding a way to reach a whole bunch of people besides going outside dressed up in a princess costume and sitting there holding my geoengineering sign. In regard to the radio, <laughs> um, yeah. the radio and the media, sometimes they're more responsive if there's an established site that they think does radio a lot. If we can be of assistance in that, let us know. On the passing out of the flyers, again, if, if it's the right flyer, I think you'll you'll eventually gain some traction there. There are PowerPoints available um, you know, right now that you can use for that purpose once you get enough uh, people that are, are interested in, in looking at that. But again, what I, I would give you a, a quote from Mr. Twain. Uh, Mark Twain said in the beginning of change, the patriot is brave and scarce, hated and scorned. But in the end, when their cause succeeds, the timid join them, for then it costs nothing to be a patriot. And, and you are indeed a, a patriot for the human race and the planet. And I, I would argue that uh, if you do not um, give up and you persevere, that soon enough you'll find others that find the courage to come out of the shadows as they see things unfolding around them. And you'll gain a following sooner than you think if you simply uh, keep refining your methods, pass out credible flyers that lead to credible sources of information, and um, as they see events unfold around them, you'll have a following sooner than you think. Wonderful. Uh, thank you for calling in. I, I appreciate the, the call. Um, I know that she's doing wonderful work. I, per, I know who, uh, who she is, and she's doing a, a lot of work around here. Um, Dane, we have a quick question from the uh, chat room, too, and then uh, we might want to, uh, you know, I'll, in fact, I'll turn on Q&A right now, and then I've got to unmute both. Q&A session started. Okay, I had to turn that off in order to get uh, that caller in. So let me go ahead and get Dane uh, plugged back in here. He's in, and let me get Clifford uh, plugged back in. Okay, good. Now, uh, if you have a question uh, for Dane or Clifford, please uh, put star, dial star six on your phone. Uh, but the, the question, Dane, we had from the uh, chat room was, uh, whistleblower needs to be credible, needs to reveal their identity to be credible. How can people come forward with the risks of death? So how can they get over that, Dane? I mean, the process of uh, exchanging information and trying to draft a statement from four retired Air Force pilots. And they are willing to put their their name on the line. And I would argue this, that we are all on the end of the plank. And for anybody who wishes to make a difference while they can, um, now is the time. And we can, we can fall off the end of the plank or we can turn around and start screaming. And I, uh, you know, as, as Mr. Snowden has just done, um, and I would say this, that at the point in time where uh, the dam really breaks, and on the geoengineering issue, so many people know, so many people are alarmed, even in academia, and I, I know a lot of these people, when the dam breaks, it's going to break from a thousand directions. If if these people are uh, sincere as, as whistleblowers, you can try to get what information you can that uh, they're willing to put their name to now and... Uh, just encourage them that, uh, that the time is not on our side. If, if they're going to try to make a difference, it has to be now. It has to be soon. And that's that's the position of these four Air Force pilots I just mentioned. And they understand the gravity of this issue. So it, it's time for everybody to, to be willing to step out into the open and take their chances. Because quite simply, the ship is going down. The ship is going down by the day. So uh, I, I would say the time uh, for our... Uh, acting is, is definitely now or never. You know, we might think about projecting ourselves into the future um, uh, a little bit in thinking about if we knew that agriculture was going to fail, if we knew that um, the soils were going to be damaged, if people were going to be coming down, if we knew the conditions that will exist three years from now, what would we, do, we be doing right now? Hopefully that makes sense. we got people lined up in the queue. Dane, when you've got a roll, you just let me know. You who are those who are calling in. Scheduled another. I just scheduled another conference call. That was. I, I didn't. I didn't have quite a long enough time, but I'm. I'm trying to delay that on the internet right now. So I'm so far so good. So let's keep going. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Dane, and, and do what you've got to do. Clifford, thank you for standing by. Uh, we've got to get back together, Clifford, if we can. I really would love to hear you complete uh, these these uh, these uh, paths of knowledge that you were you were going down tonight. Um, very intrigued. 
Um, always, always, never have enough time. Let me get to the callers real quick. Please keep. I don't your... want to. If someone's got a specific question for Clifford, I don't want to hold him up either. I mean, I'm, uh, I'll try to hang as long as I can either way. Great, thank you, Dane. Appreciate that. Okay, caller, try to keep your questions concise and to the point. We'll try to get everybody in that we can. Thank you. Okay, caller, you're on. Uh, Russ, it's Lynn. I think that you put the the you know the cue thing back on the question and answer thing. You had turned it off earlier, and then you just turned it back on a few minutes ago. Yeah, yeah, I did that on purpose because I couldn't get that last caller in without doing that. They were stuck somehow, so I had to unstick them. Okay, um, since I'm here, I'll ask a question. Um, I've actually done some research, and I don't know if um, Dane or um, your other guest tonight is familiar with this or covered it, but um, I've done some research on, on a document I came across about six months ago about converging technologies, and it's about converging technologies for improving performance, and then if you look at it bigger, it gets into globalization, global control. But it's about nanotechnology, biotechnology, information science, and cognitive science. And um, I'm just starting to look at that because I'm seeing how big an influence that is happening, that's having on a lot of issues going on. And I just actually did a search for that in geoengineering, and I got, let's see, only 8,560 hits. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm wondering if, if um, they have any any experience with that? In, in relation to, this might be something Clifford needs to answer, but in relation to human health aspects or meteorologically? Uh, or both. I think it has to do with, because it gets into robotics and human performance and changing everything about us. In fact, um, I will send you the document, Russ. Okay. Forward it to the document about the converging technology. It was a study that began in 1990. And they basically gave themselves 15 to 20 years to complete this, and they're ahead of the game. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. I'll pass. Okay. And we'll thank talk about that some other time. Well, thank you. Uh, I really appreciate you, and I love your Saturday radio program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ma'am. Clifford, you might, uh, if you have any thoughts on the uh, performance enhancement with with the human organism, I. I would think that would be. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, on my on my side, people that know my work uh, know that uh, basically it's original research, and I'm both expanded and as well as limited by what those resources are. And there's an interesting sort of transition that is just taking place now in terms of you know what I can now say uh, publicly in a fair sense. And, and those that have followed me have. They may have noticed, but uh, I actually have a problem uh, in terms of documented work um, by the use of the word term nanotechnology. Now, never ever would I make any kind of statement that, uh, you know, this doesn't exist. As a matter of fact, if we do our research, you'll, you'll find it in the very paper I was talking about tonight. This is at the heart. This is the future. Man, mankind always does uh, that which... Uh, will push its limits, whether it's for good or for evil. And so nanotechnology is at, at the absolute heart of all of this stuff. The problem that I have had is I don't have the resources, have not had the resources, to, to actually demonstrate this. And language is important on my side. And the problem I have had is, you know, nanotechnology is, you know, it's all out there, but I can't actually say anything about nanotechnology because I've never had the, the device to measure it. Um, you need an electron microscope. Yeah, in, in the, on the human organism, original. I know it's, there's a lot of ramifications, right? And as far as human health goes, I mean, you're, you are dealing with that to a degree. With Yes, uh, but the, the important issue that I wanted to make was with that photograph that I showed you tonight uh, that I've been waiting for for 15 years um, and that I had a sense of I, uh, that I could get close to it. But those photographs, that, that photograph I was showing you tonight, environmental uh, film, indeed it is. Uh, it is nano sized, and so for the first time, that will start to be able to come out in the work. I've known it's there, but if you actually look at those photographs in terms of measurements, you are dealing uh, with the filaments. I, I see them down to even 100 to 200 nanometers, and so it finally is in the scale where it can be now documented uh, publicly uh, due to the sort of courtesy and graciousness of an uh, individual that uh, provided those photographs to it. So, you know, now it's on the table, I guess, is what I'm saying from my standpoint. It doesn't mean it didn't exist. Obviously, it existed. 
but now it can be documented to a much closer level. And well, in, in regard to nanotechnology and the spraying itself and its effect on the environment, we, I think, have enough data now to say that it is affecting the entire web of life. Again, these Norwegian German researchers I mentioned earlier have given us quite compelling data that indicates that these nanoparticles are being absorbed by all plant life, causing horizontal gene mutation in that plant life. And we know from UC Riverside, their studies of the effect of these bioavailable nanoparticulates uh, on various organisms, such as trees, the, the roots if, uh, sense this toxin, they try to shut down nutrient uptake to avoid uptaking this, this contamination and protect their DNA. And, and so we see this uh, slow, protracted death of the forest. So I mean, when, when you're talking about a particle that's that small, that's bioavailable to everything, I think that um, whatever their experiments were leading to that might enhance performance, I think um, that technology is rapidly bringing us all to the verge of extinction. So anyway, um, I'm not sure if that helps, but the nanoparticulates at this point are a technology that is, is pushing life on Earth over the precipice. Go ahead, Russ. Very good. Thank you, caller. Uh, next caller, you're on. Go ahead with your question. Yes, hello. This is Catherine from Personal Media. Um, so a lot of people, I'm, I'm very passionate about this. Um, to begin with, uh, Russ and I communicated many times. Um, I've been very vocal about this. My concern is um, that when I talk to people, um, my passionate outlook on this scares people. That's number one. Number two, I, and they don't realize how serious this is. I do realize it. I'm completely in sync with you. Um, and what happens is people just kind of shut down, and they're also afraid of retaliation. They, they think that, you know, the government's watching them with all the surveillance programs. Um, you know, our names are listed, are blacklisted, and we're basically going to be killed. And if they find out that we're protesting, that they're going to spread even more. How do I deal with, how, how, do I, how do I reach people so that they don't shut down? I, I don't know how to deal with this, because it's, it's becoming depressing for me as well, even though I'm passionate, you see? <laughs> Catherine, I, I, I completely salute your passion, and I, I implore you to not lose it and to know that the, the only thing that I believe any of us own is our will. And if you are exercising your will correctly, and indeed you are, then you should find great strength in that. And these people who are afraid of the consequences of speaking out, I welcome anyone who wants to listen, and I, we all know they're listening now, yes? I welcome Anybody who wants to listen in on our line, any of the conversations I have with uh, experts relating to this issue, because I want them to know that they, in fact, are protecting programs that will indeed be the demise of themselves, their children, yeah. their posterity. We welcome them. We want them to listen. I don't know. To be honest, I don't understand why they're doing this. I understand from like a superficial point of view, but I, I am seeing trees in my area die. I, I, walk, I um, drive to work every day, and I can physically see them die every day, and it makes me cry. Personally, it makes me cry. I cannot believe this is happening, but at the same time, I have a fighting spirit, and I say, you know what? I'm going to fight this every step of the way, but people just lock down. They just they don't want to believe it. It's so bad. I have, they I have won't have a choice. They won't have a choice for long. And I, 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 I live in the forest. I walk in the forest. I take sabbaticals in the forest. I cry in the forest, just like you do. It's been my life, my whole life, and I, I know it intimately. Uh, and I... Why are they would, doing What is their madness? What, are these people completely insane? I mean... It's like a cancer. This is all like a cancer. The juggernaut of the military-industrial complex is like a cancer. Does a cancer know that it's going to kill its host and thus kill itself? I don't think so. And this is the same thing we have here. We have all these components of a global power structure, each delusional in their own in, in their own way. And in the case of geoengineering, I believe we have an arm of the power structure that is somehow convinced other arms of the power structure that it can handle the climate, that it can manage the climate, it can play God with the climate. Now I believe the power structure is beginning to realize that is not the case. They can't put the genie back in the bottle. They're killing their sleep system. It's so obvious. Like, I don't understand how a person can lose their reason to such an extent that they lose their power to understand that they're killing their food structure. They're killing it. <laughs> well, again, at the top, and, I, and we've looked at this from a what psychoanalysis. We're not going to eat anything. <laughs> we're, not, we're not dealing with sanity at the top. 4% of the population is psychopathic. And a common thread with people that are psychopathic is that they have no comprehension as to the consequences of their actions, even to themselves. 
But if we can reach enough of the population to make them understand what they're participating in and the fact that we all must face reality, our planet has now been locked into a very different scenario. Our paradigm will change. There's no, no stopping the wheels that are now turning that, that will alter the planet, but the planet could still sustain life if the geoengineering stops. Uh, at least the data indicates that that should be the case. So um, I, I would say uh, don't allow these people around you to um, take away your balance. I mean, you, you have to uh, hold on to a philosophy that allows you to engage in this without uh, uh, becoming... Part of my question. So I, I want yeah. to make this, because I don't want to hold you all night. Um, so basically the second part of my question is I'm concerned about my own health. I've started to have um, heart issues. And I know it's because of the chemtrails. I'm a super healthy person. I've eaten healthy all my life. <laughs> so there's, no, it, there's nothing that could be bad except this air that I'm breathing, these whatever particles they're putting in the air that I can't get away from. So the, the second part of my question, is there any con, um, condensed website where it could list some of the things that I can do that I can suggest my friends and family to do to protect themselves? I mean, I know that we can wear masks, but they're very visible, and I don't know if you get arrested for wearing masks. I don't know what the, the law is on race in that regard. Um, besides that, I know there are vitamins, herbs, but it would be nice to have them all in one place. You know what I mean? Is there such a place? Maybe I haven't found it yet. We have a, we have a page on our site for the, um, various procedures you can do, chelation and so forth. The masks do you no good. Nanoparticles cannot be filtered out with any normal medium. They will go right through it. So wow. the masks are, are of no help. But I, I would say back to what I was mentioning before, your philosophy can have a hell of a lot to do with your health no matter what you're breathing. The biology of belief is real, it's strong, and if, if you um, keep the right mental equilibrium, you can you can stay off so many of these effects in conjunction with taking other processes and procedures as well. But I, I know uh, Russ has good data posted on his site, Global Sky Watch, we do on Geoengineering Watch, and um, you know I, I would talk to your local health food uh, practitioners. They, they typically have a lot of good advice on chelation. Just I would do all you can there, and I would practice the proper philosophy as well in going at this in a in a way that does not um, throw well, your equilibrium off. I, I, I see my fighting spirit. That's not going to go away. <laughs> Don't lose it. Don't lose it. I salute you for that. And if we can ever be of help, contact us at GMP1. And I thank everyone who's involved in this. I really am so grateful that there are people out there who are still sane. <laughs> Don't lose your yeah. spirit, Catherine. You, you are the one that's, you're the sane one. You're the sane one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, I just want to, I would say, Catherine, if there's anything I can do, uh, this is my field. Um, you know, contact me, Russ, at globalskywatch.com, and I'll be more than happy to to tell you what I'm doing to protect myself. I'm doing a lot. I'm looking at my desk right now. I've got about 20 bottles of herbs here. I've got all kinds of stuff that I'm doing. And uh, 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 Clifford, is there anything you wanted to weigh in on this subject, or should I move on to the next question? Um. I guess all I can say is uh, probably without any question, the major bulk of my effort over the last uh, half a dozen years um, has been uh, towards the biology and, and health issues, um, and that, that work emerged out of uh, basically the environmental um, science work that preceded it, uh, the point being that this, these issues are intricately related, and the conference that uh, Dane and I uh, got a chance to see each other the first time uh, was a place where I was able to give a, a presentation on that very topic, uh, that being for the, the linkage uh, between these issues. So I do think that the attention that we have devoted towards the quote geoengineering aspects uh, ultimately uh, must be uh, sort of uh, expressed at the same intensity and, and depth uh, in, with respect to our health because these uh, are really uh, one and the same issue. Uh, we, all, we all breathe the air. You're going nowhere. Uh, you can look at your hierarchy of life, and uh, you might make it a few days without water. Uh, ask yourself how long you're going um, without air. So we're, we're all in the same mix, and the sooner we realize that, uh, uh, the better. Uh, very well said. And, and Catherine, uh, also, I, I, long story short, I've studied government corruption since the early 80s, and uh, the first few years when I really learned about the things that were going on, I went, it took me about two years to fully get over my fear. So um, it, maybe we'll have, we'll do a show on how you get over it, how you get through this, because it is a shocking and scary experience once you, 
realize the level of corruption to the point of wanting to reduce the population of of, of their own people. Uh, these those are the conclusions that I came to. It's very it's, it is very challenging, uh, but I managed to overcome it and, and get a great understanding of what was going on. So anything that I can do, uh, feel free to contact me. Maybe we'll do a show on that specifically. Okay, let's move right along to our next caller. Uh, thank you for calling, Catherine. I, I appreciate your input and your passion uh, very much as well. And, and keep keep up the good fight. Uh, caller, you're on the air. Yes, hi, my name is John, and this is for Clifford. And um, I have both a reference and a question. I have um, an amazing reference for you if you're interested. And this woman, Dorothy Espio, one of the foremost in field research, like Robert Sheldrake, and she has talked about uh, this Borg and artificial intelligence and um, certain cures for this. And I, I, I think uh, corresponding with her would, would, would uh, benefit your research because she has such uh, an awareness uh, with how uh, it affects uh, the human psychology and physically and uh, mentally and, and emotionally. And um, I really want to tie that into what I think uh, is what they are definitely afraid of and why they're spraying fluoride and how it blocks the pineal gland and how we as humans can overcome them. And I think she had some amazing keys to this. I have seen this, these filaments come out of people um, with just a certain um, healers. I could say that they believe in Jesus, they believe in Christ, and I also have seen it with people that don't believe in it. Well, actually, they do believe in, in, in Buddha and Christ, and they're doing energy transmissions, and, they're, and they are having great success, much like a right machine, through thought intention. And I know that the fluoride blocks that, and... Um, and I think that may be their intention is to try to get us in fear and not realize that we do have the power to overcome this once we have these certain keys and we figure out how to negotiate this path with certain remedies like uh, uh, silver, nano silver. I've been using that. I believe it's programmable to help fight this. Anyway, her name is Dorothy Espio, and she's at AOL.com. It's DW. I don't know if you want this, E-S-I-P-A-I-U. Okay. All right. Thank you, caller. I'll let, uh, I'll let uh, Clifford respond to that. Yeah, John, uh, thank you very much. If you can or anyone wishes to, uh, please, uh, you know, send the information to the organization um, directly so it gets in, basically gets in the coffer, uh, and that email address you'll find on the website, but it's, it's info, I-N-F-O at Um Send the information there. And on the other hand, um, we need help, folks. <laughs> we need lots of help in this organization. And one of the greatest challenges that we do face is uh, both uh, linkage and networking and dissemination of information. So, you know, when somebody basically provides information uh, to me, what I'm really asking in my own mind is, can you help us? Help us get the information out and become a part of that process because um, it, it's absolutely necessary. There's two, two main priorities, two, two, amongst others, two main priorities in the organization. One would be uh, dissemination, dissemination of the information, a summary, it would actually be a three, a summary of the information. And the third would be sort of translating uh, the information so that it's more broadly accessible, basically in a more lay format um, to the public. All of these are immediate needs. And for anybody that actually has a referral or offer of something that they think is beneficial, I would encourage you to become part of the process of that dissemination, of that translation, uh, of that summary, so that we can help people get access to the information. So uh, thank you for sending it. Uh, without your help, um, it may not be uh, sort of deployed to the level that it needs to be, is what it amounts to. So, so thank you very much for the offer. Yes, thank you, caller, for that question. And I would implore anyone to help uh, uh, Clifford's uh, work um, uh, please contribute because this is, think about where our world will be in three years and then think about right now, what would you do right now to help this cause knowing or at least hypothesizing where we will be in three years from now? 
And I think uh, if you had a clear picture of where we're headed, you would be doing a lot. Okay, we have another caller. Call, you're live. Hi, caller, you're on the air. Are you there? Mm, don't have any audio. One more time. Plus, if we get one more, I'm kind of getting the beep on this other appointment I had. If I, I, if I could take one more, I apologize. I just didn't allow quite enough time. No, no, you've done, you, you, you both are just fantastic, and I appreciate whatever time I'll, I'll, we I get. I can take one more, and then I, I probably, I, I got to go to this, I'm getting beeped right now. You got it. Okay, caller, you on the line? Caller, caller. Uh, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you now. Hello? Yep. This is Chef Dina Free, and I just want to thank you all so much, and I have a question for Dane that is very, to the point. Right now, I think one of the best ways to educate the public is because there are massive fires going on everywhere in the United States and in other places. And if some information could be put out specifically about how the chemtrails geoengineering are drying out the trees, drying out the nature, drying out the potential of rain, and therefore causing these fires to explode exponentially, that would be a great point to educate the public with because the fires have people's attention right now. Thank you. Josephina, uh, th if you're still there, this is Josephina that I communicate with once in a while in my emails? Actually, it's Shastina, like Shasta. Oh, Shastina. I, I couldn't hear you when you said that. Okay, I'm sorry. I thought I, I maybe mistook you with uh, uh, no an problem. email correspondence I have. No Thank you for your question. Yeah. It's a very, very valid question. And again, the, on the science, in relation to atmospheric saturation with particulates, it is very clear. It diminishes and disperses precipitation and evaporation, period. And yes, there's still deluge around the globe in places. It, it throws the whole hydrological cycle off. But where those particulates are dispersed, you know, and again, the Western U.S. is a great example. Australia was a great example last year. Tasmania, all uh, record fires. Uh, Siberia last year lost 100 million acres of boreal forest to fires. So if they try to create these artificial clouds and they blanket spray the eastern Pacific about 24-7, as they block the sunlight, the light photons don't break the uh, water molecules loose to cause evaporations and stops storm formation. So you have what, it, what moisture you do have coming in, they migrate it by saturating the skies with these particulates. So you have much less precipitation. The precipitation that is coming down, again, is toxic. It has the effect in the roots I mentioned earlier, causes a slow protracted, protracted death of the trees. And when there is no precipitation falling and they're saturating the skies with these desiccants, they're uh, they attract and accrete all available moisture, so everything dries out extremely quickly, even after a precipitation event. There's no dew in the morning. It sucks the moisture out of the atmosphere, and, and yes, it migrates east, and it eventually comes down in a deluge somewhere else, but the areas that they blanket spray, in this case, the, you know, the, the jet stream movement goes from west to east, so they blanket spray everything coming in from the Pacific, absolutely parches the western U.S., and again, I encourage people to look up the U.S. drought monitor on any search engine, it will shock you. The division line in the center of the country from north to south, the west half being extreme drought, and the drought is actually much worse than even that map shows. The eastern half of the U.S., you have uh, record, record rains in many areas. So in addition to this, you have increased lightning because you have a more conductive atmosphere, and, and again, along with the de decreased precipitation. And now you have what amounts to an incendiary dust, all these fine metallic particles coating all of the foliage, also being absorbed through some of that foliage, which further uh, causes the decline of those organisms. So you have really the, the perfect storm for creating fires. And as, as the forest has been poor, poisoned over so many years, it cannot handle the strain anymore. The trees are dying by the day. The drought is extremely protracted. Again, in my area alone, we're almost 200 inches of rain short seven years. I, we normally get 70 inches of rain where I live, which is a lot. We're down to 40. It comes in much more condensed fashion. It'll be a deluge and then record dry for two months. And, and quite simply, the ecosystems can't take anymore. This is exactly what we'd expect with geoengineering, exactly what we're seeing. And as these fires burn, as they, they feed the positive loops, cycle loops, the feedback mechanisms for the climate, so they burn, they put more particles into the atmosphere, and, and thus, instead of being carbon sinks, they become carbon sources. It just feeds this negative cycle even more. So uh, bottom line is geoengineering, uh, 
appears to be the single greatest cause for the forest fires because very simply, and I'll finish with this, the atmosphere holds 7% more moisture for every degree of Fahrenheit warming. The planet is absolutely warmer, significantly warmer than current uh, media is willing to allude to. We should have more overall global precipitation, not less. And yes, I know there is more precipitation in regions, but overall, the, look at the global drought monitor, and you'll see there is a great deal of drought in, in places where uh, there's a strategic purpose for these programs. Droughting out Africa, the U.S. has boots on, on the ground in 150 countries around the globe. They use drought as a weapon all over the globe. So the forest fires are absolutely so completely directly connected to geoengineering. And people should examine this, and this is covered in the PowerPoint, which I just posted on Geoengineering Watch, and as well as some other articles we have there. But thank you for bringing that that point up, extremely important point. Drought and fires on one end of the equation, deluge and flooding on the other. Great. Uh, thank you so much, caller. I know, Dane, you've got to run. Um, I just want you to, um, to plug your website and uh, maybe the Saturday show. Any final words you'd like to say before you roll? No, thank you very much to everybody who's taken the time to try to educate themselves on this issue. If we can be of more help at Geoengineering Watch, uh, we, we will try. Geoengineeringwatch.org. Russ, thank you for, for your help, your site. Clifford, um, thank you very much for all you brought to the table. And I, I certainly have uh, passed out literally thousands of your first documentary. Um, that was uh, really something that got this whole ball rolling. So we all hold you in very highest regard. I apologize I did not allow quite enough time for this, but anyway, uh, my most sincere gratitude to everybody involved. Great. Thank you, Dane, so much. You, ha you have a good evening, and we'll be chatting with you again. Uh, everybody who's listening in, geoengineeringwatch.org. Uh, also, Dane has a uh, radio talk show that we have on Saturday afternoons at 12 noon Pacific time and 3 p.m. Eastern time. Richard Sachs and myself co-host that show with Dane, and you can see that show at ucy.tv. If you have trouble finding that link, just go to globalskywatch.com, and right on the home page in the left sidebar, we have a link to Geoengineering Watch Radio. You can click on that and go right to the radio program and right to the archive. So, Dane, thank you so much um, for, for all your help and everything that you've done. We still have uh, Clifford Carnicom. I know we've, uh, we've run over, as I expected we would, with, with two guests such as this. Um, uh, Clifford, uh, would, I want to just throw the ball in your court and, uh, with the highest respect, give you uh, the option, uh, if you uh, if you want to handle a couple more questions, you're welcome to. But if I know we've run way over, if you need to go, I, I totally understand what what works for you. Yeah, thank thank you, Russ. Um, I, I do have to leave shortly, but by the same token, uh, I'd be willing to try and work uh, with a couple of questions if we'd like to. Uh, you know, another uh, five or ten minutes won't be an issue, and I'd like to help in that way if I can. But I will have to leave shortly after that. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much for that. So if anyone, uh, you who have questions for Clifford specifically, um, please uh, call into the console and press star six on your phone, and you should enter the Q&A queue, um, the little star, and then the number six once you've dialed in. And let me just give you the dial-in number just to make sure that you have it. It's 559-726-1300. And the access code is 156230. I'm going to go ahead and paste that into the chat room now so you have it there. So if you have a question for Clifford, please call that number and press star six. If you need that number again, just go to globalskywatch.com forward slash live, L-I-V-E, all small letters, and you'll see all the call in information uh, right there. And I do, uh, Cl Clifford, the information, once you get started on, on some of these lectures, I just want them to keep going because you, you were getting into some, so, so much information. I feel like you could, you really could uh, give just numerous lectures right off the top of your head. Um, I, I hope uh, we can have you back sometime in the near future and we could go down some of the, these threads and just let you, like we've done before, just let you have the floor and, and, and share everything you want to share. Yeah, thank you, Russ. I'd be, I'd be glad to try and help out. Also, I wanted to mention uh, on this current paper I'm working with, um, actually, internally, we met last week, and we did have a discussion, and I'm anticipating right now that we'll probably have a discussion for each one of those three phases of this paper that I referred to. And the first one was actually completed uh, last week, and that was recorded somewhat uh, in a similar fashion to what you're doing with us tonight. Uh, and the screen 
wheelchair will be there. And we're going to make that available. I actually think that should be available within the next week or two. I think the rough uh, edit has already been done, a rough draft of it. And uh, that will be an introduction. I anticipate two more of those, one for the second phase and one for the uh, third. Uh, I know the first phase may be a little bit more difficult for people to want to bear with on the identification process. And yet, and yet uh, I don't have anything to work with unless the uh, work for that has been done. So that will be one way. Hopefully that discussion is already starting and become and can become available to the public. So, so thank you for that. Excellent. I've got up on the screen right now, carnicominstitute.org, which is your website. Uh, I implore people to go there, research. Uh, there's a whole list of research papers that you can read. Um, you can also donate if you want this type of important work, which drives this movement, which drives and gives us the the ammo that we need to present this not only to the public but to officials and to other scientists then you need to donate to this cause so they can get the equipment they're literally uh, Clifford and his team are, are making these things happen right now on a budget uh, that is that should be just overwhelmingly supported but I know a lot of us in this movement we have a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, you know financial concerns ourselves but you know even if it's $5, if, if, if all of us got together and made a donation, it's amazing that the difference, uh, the difference that could be made in supporting his cause. Now, um, if anyone does have a call, uh, Clifford's got just about 10 more minutes at most. Feel free to call in on the console. We went through a lot of calls earlier. Uh, Dane had to go, but we, uh, um, we, we do have... Uh, uh, a couple slots open if you want to go ahead and call so go ahead and feel uh, feel free to call in um, are there any is there anything you'd like to uh, share while we just take a moment here and uh, let anyone call in who wants who has a question um, any important points you'd like to uh, to share with people about uh, where uh, well actually the one thing I want to say is is the the, the the presentation you were just talking about they that's on carnicominstitute.org as, as well is that what you said video form is of the first uh, phase of the paper. It looks like it's going to be available on the site in the next week or two at most. The, the written form is about two-thirds done, uh, about 70 pages. I, I can't pretend that it's uh, enjoyable reading. And this is why there really is help needed in terms of the issue of, of summarizing and, and translation of this information. I have to get it out in the way that the research unfolds. And then there's a need to communicate, and unfortunately, communicate the actual uh, intent as well as the detail of that information. And unfortunately, the process actually takes years to happen. You know, most of my environmental, what we're calling geo geoengineering work, much of that work was done over 10 years ago. And the issues that we're speaking of uh, in, tonight are directly relevant to those papers where I put my best foot forward in, in terms of dealing with some of these questions and problems that we're talking about tonight. Unfortunately, it takes years to get through this process of dissemination translation. Now, part, partly that's due to my uh, shortcomings as uh, basically uh, a communicator and promoter of the information because I'm primarily in the, in the uh, mode of the, of the research. But it is what needs to be done. Uh, and, you know, in terms of the appeal for contribution to you made, I, I would like to extend, extend that idea and, and really, I'm not speaking of monetary. I mean, sure, that's there. It, 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 absolutely, it's there. But, you know, as I expressed on the closing lines of that original documentary, this, to me, always ultimately comes down to what are you? That means every person that hears these words from your show. What are you willing and able and will do? What will you actually do as opposed to say or think or wonder about what will you actually do. Um, and there is this phrase, it's taken me a while to sort of get through that because I grew up with the educational system as this priority basically, this is your path to understanding and wisdom, right? But uh, I've been through that system and, and you always heard this phrase, I did, I was growing up, and you still hear it repeated, this says knowledge is power. And I sort of learned it through an alternative set of conferences that I went to, but, you know, I realized that 
that statement, as much as it's promoted, is woefully inadequate. Uh, knowledge um, it means nothing, actually, in, unless you use it. The, 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 the action with the knowledge is power. And so ultimately, I would always ask each person that are, you know, is wondering what can they do. You do what you're good at. You do whatever you can do. Can you imagine if every single person that listens to this and talks to someone, that if every person actually does something, whatever it is, and with whoever you want to do it. You know, I have one organization that was formed because of my need to try and extend myself to the best degree that I could because I'm both openly asking for help. But it doesn't have to be with me. But I think ultimately everyone is responsible for what you actually do versus what you know or what you learn or what you think about. And I think it's actually a very simple question to ask in terms of what are you actually doing? And that's what I would ask people to think about and then actually make the decision. Where are they going to put their, their foot forward? I happen to be a researcher. I, you know, if I was a musician, which I actually play around with on the side, but I, I don't actually have that talent to that level. If I was a musician, I'd be thinking. If I was a speaker, I'd be speaking. If I was an inventor, I would be making things. I would be doing things in every way that I could. And I think every one of us has that opportunity and need. That's right. That's very well said. Um, we all, um, I, could, I can't improve on that. If you, if you have any skill that you have, five minutes a week, five minutes a day, um, if we all do that, if that's all we can do, or monetarily, you know, I do encourage, I mean, uh, Clifford is very, uh, very kind about, uh, you know, not, you know, maybe not going, uh, going there too much, but, but I'm a little more aggressive about saying, because I'm not asking this for myself, you know, support these people who need the equipment, who... If you want the research to go faster and more efficiently, it's up to you, people. It's up to you how this goes. We do have a question. Let me get to our caller here, and then we'll let Clifford go shortly. Um, caller, you're on the air. Hello, Russ. Dan in Rochester. Hey, Dan. How's it going? Great. How are you? Oh, hanging in there. Good. Hi, Clifford. Yes, hi, Dan. How are you? Just great. Pleasure, pleasure to talk to you. Um, I want you to know I, I've been studying the uh, the whole chemtrail thing for a good number of years, and uh, I think it was actually your some of your research that you had posted on the internet that uh, absolutely shocked me <laughs> uh, into uh, doing something about this. And it, it's um, I, I think we as I think Dane said it, whoever, but uh, we do all. Uh, owe you a tremendous amount for him taking such an uh, obviously an enormous amount of time out of your life to to do the research that you have, and uh, it uh, what what seems to move me an awful lot is it, like the previous uh, an earlier caller uh, the reality of all this stuff is what what gets me and and I, I think it's probably true with a lot of people but. You know, I, I like to reference something that I think I remember reading on your site at, at one point a few years ago, where you had taken, I don't know if it was bacteria or what it was, but if I remember correctly, you can correct me here if I'm wrong, but if, if I remember, you had taken something like bacteria or something from uh, chemtrails, and it, it, I think you had said that what you found was if you left that in a petri dish, it could take upwards of, of even like months before it would um, reproduce itself or whatever it would grow. But you found that if you exposed it to a certain color of light, that it would grow a lot faster. Do I remember that correctly? There is a one specific uh, paper, Dan, that I think is what you're referring to. And... It was one of hundreds of basically uh, experiments and projects that have been written up. Uh, I often try to repeat things if I have the luxury over and over and over. In this particular case, it wasn't necessarily it was isolated, but it hasn't been extended. But all, all we can say in that particular case is that 
one of the culture projects that was underway, and there have been several, uh, several culture projects uh, based upon primarily environmental samples and also biological samples. These are the two sources for the cultures that have been uh, developed. But in one of those, uh, a very unusual sort of situation developed, and that was a extremely rapid um, uh, growth response. Uh, well, yes, with a particular wavelength of light. That is what you're saying. And it's really the value of that paper to me was that it raised the question uh, and, and the need to become knowledgeable. I mean, we have to learn. We have to know. We can't just guess. And that paper, the title of the paper had the word frequency in it or, or equivalent of wavelength, wavelength was in there. And the point of the paper was that there, there is a, a, a form of energy that can affect um, these growth, these cultures of growth, and that if we're just playing around and hoping something is working, and basically this is this is what comes from many of the people that talk about both the Rife technology. What they'll say is, I have a Rife machine, and I just dial in this frequency, and everything's fine. And I personally have a problem unless I understand what the basis of the frequency. Uh, use is that you just don't pick a frequency. Frequencies are infinite in their number. And, and the point of this uh, paper, in part at least, was that a particular frequency, in this case, exaggerated the growth. And people often always speak somehow in the use of uh, what you call frequency therapies and those type of methods, that somehow it's always therapeutic, that somehow it's always helping things, that somehow if you apply a frequency, it's going to cause something to diminish, and that it's a simple answer if you just had one of these machines. And all I was saying was, if you don't know what you're doing, if you don't have a basis for what it is you're applying, then you could be worse off than you would if you thought you were doing something. And that was one of the main points of the, of the paper was to raise the question and, and the need for us to become knowledgeable and one small part of it would be an understanding of how does how does electromagnetics how does the issue of electromagnetics affect uh, the physical changes that have been made in the atmosphere? And that's a huge issue, and uh, I've tried to make some sense into it. So thanks for taking the time to become aware uh, of that paper. Yeah, well, like, like I said, I, I, I believe it was that exact paper that uh, I hadn't come across anything that profound up to that point and that that absolutely jarred my existence you know because I'm, I'm pretty uh, inquisitive you know I research things pretty deeply myself as a matter of fact and I, I agree with you by the way that uh, knowledge is not power it is the ability to do something with that knowledge uh, 100% and uh, speaking to that as a matter of fact uh, the only question I have left and it's wonderful talking to you I've been meaning to, to see one of your uh, presentations at different times, just haven't been able to do it. And Russ, thanks for this great show. This has been another remarkable, eye-opening session that you've had. It's pretty awesome to have you and the uh, resources you have. But Clifford, just real quick, how can uh, how can somebody get involved with with your need? For example, I've got a tremendous grasp of the English language and. I, you know, I can write things, I can read things, summarize things. I mean, if that's the type of thing that, that you need help with, I would absolutely love to help you guys out. Do I just go to your website, or how, how would any of us get involved with what you're doing? And that's that my last question. Thanks for taking my call. Yeah, th thank you for asking. Um, the answer, I can't say what would happen ultimately, but in terms of getting the process started, um, it probably takes, it would take maybe one word, maybe probably two words, a uh, subject and a verb. Um, but yeah, if you'd send an email uh, to the organization, there's a there's a contact page on I think on the home site you can get to easily. Just send an email, and you could. I mean, I could see the word uh, I'm interested, and that would be sufficient to get the process started. Now, um, if you elaborate a little bit, then it certainly it helps. But in terms of how the process works of becoming involved in the organization, uh, generally it's this: um, a person expresses an interest. That's all they would need to do. Then. Um, it's up to us to make contact with you and encourage you in that process. What I would like 
to also make known, and it's, it's just an honest statement by me, is that the standards of conduct and participation in, in this organization are high uh, in the sense that they're professional. This is not a place to hang out. The people that are in this organization are working very hard. They're working hard totally uh, with their own devotion to help you, you being the, the entire public audience. So it's uh, if anybody is of a mindset where they actually want to do something, as Dan is expressing, and you're sincere, our job is to try to make that pathway open to you. And if anyone ever feels that they were not given that opportunity uh, fairly, in that case, you actually have to talk to me and let me know, because that's very important. Everybody deserves that opportunity fairly. The standards will be high. Um, but almost anyone can help as far as I see it. Um, it's, uh, so I guess this is how I would answer it. Say, you're, say that you're interested. It's our job to respond to you, have some patience. But if you're good at anything you do, no matter how trivial it would be or how advanced it would be, there's supposed to be a place um, for you to help because that need that you just, you know, and, and service that you just expressed is one of our primary needs. Uh, you, if you were a part of our meetings, we, we meet once a week uh, on the phone, and people are doing things all the time when they can. But if you were list, listening into our meetings, you would you would realize that there is now an active call for someone to take all 300 plus papers that I have written, starting at the very beginning, and write a what would be called a synopsis, a summary, an abstract, however you want to do it. That is uh, scientifically accurate. That the that the description is accurate, summary is accurate, but that it communicates effectively um, uh, the gist of that paper in a very short uh, style, a, a paragraph at most, probably, on every single paper that has been written. That's an active, open need, and and we can't say that the staff is not trying to do things. They're doing as much as they possibly can. But I will tell you, uh, nobody has met that need yet, and you will heard me mention it over the last uh, three, two to three months in our meetings easily. So um, I, I invite you and Dan at any time to, uh, to offer that and any other services that you would like to. And if you get frustrated in the process or something like that, that's fair to say. You just go ahead and say it. Uh, but our job is to make the opportunity available to you. Great. Thank you so much for that question, Dan. Uh, Dan's been uh... A tremendous help. He is a researcher. In fact, we had a show with him, but we had some audio problems keeping him on the line. But uh, uh, but he uh, helps provide a lot of information and a lot of research for us as well. So thank you, Dan, for that. Well, Clifford, uh, it's 11 o'clock on the Eastern Coast already. We have done, what is this, uh, eight, uh, two and a half hours. Um, I want to tell you how much I deeply appreciate you taking the time to share your information and especially to devote your life to research, which I believe is the thrust of, of all activism. It starts uh, with knowledge, and Clifford, in his research and work, is providing us with that uh, knowledge, with a secure place uh, to attain knowledge and information. So let me just give you the floor to say whatever final words you'd like to say, and then I'll give uh, our quick closing announcements uh, so, uh, so it's all yours. What would you like to say? Yeah, Russ, thanks a whole lot. I mostly just wanted to thank you uh, for making this venue uh, available to us. I have to say it was uh, my natural instinct um, when uh, Dane was asking to uh, try and collaborate uh, with us a little bit stronger. Uh, my natural instinct, and it's what I followed up on, is just to call you because you provide a very uh, relaxed and open and comprehensive uh, forum uh, for people to uh, speak. And so uh, I wanted to thank you for following up and doing that as well as with Dane. I'm uh, glad we made it happen. Um, and uh, uh, we will continue, I hope. And in terms of helping, if you want to help, <laughs> help get the information out that Russ has uh, accumulated here and help all three parties as well as the public um, get the information out to, to people um, so that we can uh, basically make a change. The, the goal is to make a change and enjoy enjoy uh, the the fruits of existence basically in, in this planet and in general cosmos as far as that goes but uh, uh, use the uh, uh, spiritual and, and mental and physical talents that we all have that's where it all goes back uh, uh, listen life should be a a fruit
fruitful and uh, in, enchanting and enjoyable experience. And it, it's it's us that make that make that happen. We make that happen. So um, uh, I hope we can all um, share in that process. And thanks a whole lot for uh, letting me be here tonight. I appreciate it very much. Well, it's all of our honor, and uh, I, we all appreciate the work that you do. We always speak so highly of you. Uh, your early work in documentaries were the door that opened up the vision for so many people to these things that were going on. And so I want to implore everyone, please visit uh, CarnicomInstitute.org. Um, uh, if you can volunteer, if you can donate, please do something. It's one thing to edify yourself. But it's a whole nother thing when you edify the whole. And the work that Carnicom Institute is doing is bringing knowledge through research to all of us that can give us the power we need. Just like, you know, it's not knowledge that's power, but we can apply that knowledge and we can make a change in this world, put an end to these bad policies, put an end to harmful scientific, so-called scientific practices like spraying toxic metals all over us and whatever else they're spraying, which is which is revealed uh, uh, and, and analyzed in such detail in Carnicom's work. So please visit and volunteer and help CarniconInstitute.org and do what you can. Even if it's five minutes a day, if we all do that, it will make a tremendous difference. Also, don't forget Dane, GeoengineeringWatch.org. Uh, that's Dane's website. Uh, please support them as well. And please remember our Saturday show, 12 noon Pacific time, 3 o'clock p.m. Eastern time at ucy.tv. Uh, if you'd like a link to this show, if you'd like to hear this show or you want to share this program with friends, go to globalskywatch.com. And then at the top of the Global Skywatch website, there's a link that says live online meetings. Click on that. And in the left sidebar, if you're watching our stream, you can watch me do this. There's recorded meetings. Click on that. And you'll have all of our meetings we've ever done are archived here, so you can share them with friends. The information contained, uh, Carnicom has been, uh, Clifford Carnicom has been on our uh, program, on our conference here a couple times previously with some uh, information that you really do need to share, you need to listen to, to enrich your life and understand better what is really going on in the world. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Um, this has been uh, a groundbreaking night for us. We've had more attendance than we've ever had in this program, which doesn't surprise me a bit. I expected it with two guests such as this. And in the future, I, uh, I hope to do this again and uh, get into some of these threads of information that Clifford uh, began to cover. But of course, we, we often don't have the time to finish all of these things, but hopefully we will in the near future. Everyone take care of yourself. Please keep spreading the word. Volunteer. Do what you can, because everything that you do, even if it's five minutes a day, makes a tremendous difference. Think about where this world will be three years from now. It may not be a pleasant thought, but it could be a much better thought if you act today based on what you think might happen in three years if you don't act. Take care of yourselves. We'll see you next week. This show's homepage is at Global Sky Watch dot com forward slash live you can see all of our past guests and our upcoming guests and get all the detailed information about how you can listen live on our live stream you all have a good night and we'll see you next time